I had Best. only ring long hair. <laughs> Short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love it. Like a helmet. <laughs> it works. All right. Uh, I will await a motion to come out of non public session. So moved. Second. Second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 And now we will uh, begin the meeting uh, with a uh, uh, call the roll. Connor, oh. We need to seal the minutes as well. Oh, oh yes. Can Come. I move we um, adjourn the meeting, meeting and seal the minutes? Second. All in favor of that? Aye. 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 All right. Um, we will now um, have a roll call. Mayor McCaughrin? Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Here. Councilor Tabor? Here. Councilor Denton? Here. Councilor Moreau? Here. Councilor Bagley? Here. Council Lombardi? Here. Council Blaylock? Here. Council Cook? Here. If you join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. So we have two proclamations uh, this evening. Uh, the first is uh, with regards to actually the state of New Hampshire's birthday here, the United States Constitution Day. So whereas June 21st, 2022 marks the 234th birthday of the U.S. Constitution, and whereas Portsmouth's John Langdon, delegate to the Constitutional Convention, was one of 38 signers of the U.S. Constitution adopted by Congress in 1787, and whereas led by Langdon, New Hampshire became the ninth and deciding state vote to ratify the U.S. Constitution on June 21st, 1788, thereby making New Hampshire the state that made us a nation. And whereas when New Hampshire passed the ratification, the state was also admitted to the union, making the former colony the, colony the ninth state. So June 21st is also New Hampshire's birthday. And whereas the, U the submarine USS New Hampshire was christened on this day in honor of this historic date, and whereas in 1783, New Hampshire was the first state to create its own constitution, thereby setting the example for other colonies and the Continental Congress to follow, and whereas Portsmouth's the city of the open door was home to three governors and has welcomed presidents from George Washington to Joe Biden and upholds an unwavering record of allegiance to the nation and the U.S. Constitution. Now, therefore, I, Daglan McCachran, mayor of the city of Portsmouth, on behalf of the members of the city council and citizens of Portsmouth, do hereby proclaim this day as the United States Constitution Day given with my hand in the seal of the city of Portsmouth on this 21st day of June, 2022. Do we have Sue Paula Dora here? And Sue was the one that reached out, and she seems that this is not your normal outfit, Sue. Um, but I understand that, that I'll come and, and give this. And um, we have another proclamation, but I, I want to thank you uh, for. It is for an august occasion indeed. And tonight I'm representing Elizabeth Landon Barrow, sister of Governor John Landon, who in New Hampshire in 1788 was the one that proposed that we be the ninth state to sign, to uh, ratify the Constitution that had been approved the previous year. It was his effort that led us into being one of the nine states of the Arch of the Republic. And on his behalf, I bid you greetings and salutations. He was a former citizen of Pleasant Street and a very illustrious citizen of the city of Portsmouth, known as the town of Portsmouth in those days. It is through his effort that we are now celebrating today the 234th anniversary of the ratification, therefore, being the 234th birthday of the state of New Hampshire. The colony of New Hampshire became the state of New Hampshire on that day, and it has been, it was his pleasure to make it so. So on his behalf, I thank you for issuing this proclamation 
and I thank all of the city of Portsmouth and I encourage them to look at the history behind this day. It's not just a history of a birthday, it is the history of our state and those people that made it happen. And with that, I will withdraw. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, hopefully not before taking this. So. I will take that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You look wonderful, Sue. Thanks. John Langdon's wife. Sister. 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 John Langdon's sister. sister. So we have our next proclamation, uh, and I'm going to ask the assistant mayor uh, to read this. Um, it is uh, humbling to recognize uh, Juneteenth for a number of uh, of reasons. I think that um, the fact that it took so long uh, to get down to Texas and, and tell uh, the slaves there that the Emancipation Proclamation had been delivered uh, nearly two and a half years uh, earlier. It's also uh, worth reflecting that this almost falls to the day of when we ratified the, the Constitution here in New Hampshire, uh, where all men were created equal, but took 77 years later for that, those words to to really ring true, um, it's a it's honor to have our assistant mayor uh, read this proclamation. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Whereas on June 19, 1865, in Galveston, Texas, Major General Gordon Granger of the United States Army issued Order Number Three that read, "The people of Texas are informed that, in accordance with a proclamation from the Executive of the United States, all slaves are free." This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of personal property between former masters and slaves. And the connection hereforth existing between them becomes that of between employer and hired labor. And whereas that general order finally extended the intention of the 1863 13th Amendment to free all Africans still held in bondage in the states. And whereas African-American communities, including Portsmouth, have celebrated Juneteenth or Emancipation Day for decades. And whereas in 2013, New Hampshire State Senator Martha Fuller Clark sponsored the legislation for New Hampshire to declare Juneteenth as a holiday and picked up the bill off the table in 2017 so our represent representatives could continue to push for a state recognition of Juneteenth, which was declared a federal holiday in 2021. And whereas, in Portsmouth, we recognize Juneteenth to remember a critical part of American history and pay tribute to the achievements and deeply rooted culture of the black community in our city and rededicate ourselves to our commitment to being a racial justice municipality. Now, therefore, I, Deglin McCracken, Mayor of, Ports of the City of Portsmouth, on behalf of the members of the Council and the citizen of, citizens of Portsmouth, do hereby proclaim Juneteenth 2022 in Portsmouth and urge all members of the community to learn more about the Emancipation Proclamation and the history behind this holiday and to join in celebrations, commemorations, and other programs and tributes organized by members such as the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, the Seacoast African American Cultural Center, and Black Lives Matter Seacoast, given with my hand in the seal of the city on this day, 19th on this 19th day of June, 2022. Next up, we have the, uh, thank you, Assistant Mayor. Um, next up, we have the acceptance of minutes for May 2nd, uh, 2022 and May 9th, 2022. So moved, Your Honor. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Now we have what many of you have come here for. Uh, <laughs> that's to see the Portsmouth tax uh, rate go up because we're buying all these plaques. Uh, and I don't know if we budgeted uh, for it. But um, in all seriousness, this is, I think, all of our uh, favorite thing uh, to do in City Hall uh, is to recognize uh, the youth. We want to, we'll take any excuse uh, to do so, uh, but that everyone has, has competed uh, so hard um, and, and come out on top. You don't always come out on top. Um, and so it's, it's tough to, to just recognize uh, those in, in City Hall that, that do. Um, but as athletes, this is what you've been working for your entire season. 
Um, and so we want to celebrate this, this excellent achievement. I'm going to ask uh, your athletic director, uh, Kaz, to come join me. I'm going to say a few words down there. We've got to remember to speak into the microphone or nobody hears us at home. Uh, but really looking forward to this. So first up is the boys outdoor track and field. And I just said to speak into the microphone, and, you're and not. I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So first up, is this on? Kevin, you got me? Yep, I see a thumbs up. Uh, the Portsmouth High School boys outdoor track and field team had a great showing at the NHIAA Division I track and field championships a few weeks ago held in Salem High School. The team led by head coach Mike Lyford. Are you Mike? Okay. These are priorities, man. Come on. <laughs> Well, in addition to getting married, he, uh, he led them to claim uh, its first Division I state championship since 1985. They did win the D2 uh, championship in 2018. Portsmouth High School team total was 97.5 points over runner-up Nashua. And you think that's going to be close. It's not. It's 59 points. That's unbelievable. Several student athletes broke school records that night, including Ahmed Nada in the 100 meter with a time of 11.01 .01, and Nate Fletcher in the 300 hurdles with 38.74 and 200 meter 21.99. This is blazing fast. Uh, all in a great day for the Clippers. So give yourselves another round of applause. And I, you want me to call him up? Which one do you want to do? I was going to hand him. Yeah. Okay, so you call him up. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you should be getting used to this now. Listen, right? <laughs> you don't always come to these things, Kaz. <laughs> All right, so first up, Ethan Avery. Uh, Theodore Beatty. Samuel Bourne. Yeah. Avery Crowell. Yeah. Princeton Daniel. Chester Duraki. <laughs> Noah Donovan. <laughs> Nate Fletcher. <laughs> Jake Haley. Ethan Lant. <laughs> Jacob Lovern. <laughs> Max Machado. William Margison. <laughs> ben McFarlane. <laughs> Cole McLaughlin. <laughs> Kelly Moriarty. Matthew Mower, <laughs> Ahmed Nada, I would have expected him to come up a little faster. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Dylan Palermo. <laughs> Broderick Parrott. Jackson Raganese. Ian Ripperger. Michael Schaff. Trevor Stacy, Evan Venn, Jay Wendell. Luke Whistler. <laughs> Tyler Wilson. <laughs> and Jason Yetton. <laughs> Got your boys D1 state track team. Chance. That's awesome, guys. Next up, we have girls lacrosse. And I have some uh, words about this, uh, this season. But this one's actually uh, cool for my family. My, my sister was actually one of the, the founding members of the girls uh, Portsmouth High School lacrosse team here in Portsmouth. And that was 20 years ago, I guess, in, in July. I asked Kaz. I think he said that was true. Um, but <laughs> you've come an enormous, like it's, I think one of, I was looking back over uh, some of the, the, the teams they played and it was, you know, it was, it, the record wasn't 19 and two. Um, and to see that it's nearly nine out of 10 is, is amazing. So um, in terms of the, uh, or nine out of the last 20 uh, years championships, it's amazing. Portsmouth High School girls of class led by coach Jojo Kuro finished this season with a 19-2 record in Division II and was victorious over Hollis Brookline High School by a score of 20 to seven. So not much Ooh. in doubt on that one to win their fifth consecutive NHIAA Division II state championship. The team was the odd-on favorite to win the championship this year. However, they never let that get to their head. They worked hard, are very humble, and just got the job done. All of the student athletes were honor roll students as well. I didn't read that about the boys high school track team. They were, they were. Okay, so everybody is. Um, the, Clipper, the, the Clipper girls uh, lacrosse program will move up to set sail and compete in division one next spring. We are just absolutely so proud of you guys and all the work you've done. Please give yourselves a round of applause. All right, so when you are ready to go, we're ready to go? All right, so I know Ellie's, oh, Ellie's not here. It's gonna go on this side. All right, so Maggie McDonald. Charlotte Marston. Anya Bake. Morgan Runke. Sadie Alotti. Uh, Julia Roloffs? I didn't see her, no. Um, 
Avery Runke. Annie Parker. Sally Collins. Emily Kumpf. Maggie Parker. Annie Campbell. Maggie Conklin. Ariana Incolingo. Arden Griffin. And, and Coach Jojo Curro. Changed it up. You didn't read the people that weren't here that time. You're getting better. I'm getting worse on that one. We'll see if we can bring it, bring it home. All right. Last but not least is boys across uh, the high school boys across team led by Coach Chad Fisher finished the season with a 19 and one record. Wow. wow. Division two and beat rival Dairyfield School by a score of 16 to 10. So a little closer on that one. Uh, still going away uh, to win their second consecutive NHIAA Division II state championship last week held at Exeter High School. This year's boys team was led by a really great defense and goaltenders, offensive attack, and face-off specialists. However, their bond and support as a team was strong, and that's what helped them achieve success. We are so proud of you boys lacrosse. Give yourselves a really big round of applause. All right, here we go. All right, Nathan Amend. Zach Amend. <laughs> Those things are heavy. <laughs> All right, Torin Brewer. Uh, just to let you know, a lot of people went on vacation and stuff like that already, so, I, okay. <laughs> um, t yeah, no. Uh, Max Brown. Um, James Buchan. Dom Bono. Caleb Comstock. Noah DeYoung. Keegan Delisle. <laughs> Max Diep. <laughs> Ryan Edwards. <laughs> Noah Foster. <laughs> Caleb Green. <laughs> Gunnar Jackson. Brady Kilroy. Dom Maldari. Riley Collins. Skyler McLeides. That's our goalie. Keegan Myers. Michael O'Neill. Brandon Park. Charlie Pascaloni. Baden Patterson. Ryan Tatton. Ben Purcell. Dylan Roloffs, 
Macy Schoen, Nick Smith, Luke Suheski, Peter Wool, Briggs Catino, Ethan Lander, nope, Max Durkin, and Matt Brasson. Well, um, that's awesome. Um, well, well, it's listen. There's uh, we can't you know. There's a, a huge amount of commitments that you all have um, that you were able to to come here um, in in our in our city's house. This is you know this is this is your building. Uh, it means a lot to us that we can recognize you here in person tonight. If you could all come up and could we grab a picture of everybody just filling in in front of the dais, and uh, we'll let you. You don't have to stick around for the rest of the meeting after that. You guys can just head out and take pictures uh, afterwards. Awesome. Yeah, I think there's enough people down there. Is Stephanie here? Yeah. You guys, you'll fill in behind, too. Yeah, fill in behind the team. Yeah, you yeah, you go. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Don't be shy. Be cruise directors. Fill in. Fill in. <laughs> on, keep an eye on director. Filling in the space. Keep going. <laughs> Good job. They don't take care. Yeah, that's smart. Wow. <laughs> but the guy who knows them do it. Some of them were almost as tall as Dick. One of them was. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, Cole. Few words. 
Oh, I, I, yeah, and half the people left. That's okay. I just wanted to thank you guys all for your support so much for our community. Uh, Portsmouth Police Department, Portsmouth Fire Department um, escorted us around town uh, three nights in June, which were unbelievable. Um, I know we were pretty loud downtown and it was late, um, but everybody was pretty nice and screaming for us and everything. It was so much fun. This kind of caps everything off and it's a recognition that um, I always look forward to and I think it's in a different setting for all the kids and everything like that. So it's very important that we come here and that you know we get to meet you guys and everything like that and see this side of government and um i love this so i love having these kids here and um i beg for them i go you gotta go don't go on vacation um so but i just want to say again thank you so much mayor and city council for everything so all the support and everything like that so have a great summer and we'll definitely see you in the fall with something so Well, uh, that was awesome. Um, we now are on to public comment. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you're on Zoom, um, we have everybody signed up here, but if you're on Zoom, please raise your hand in the next minute or two um, so we know that you want to speak. Uh, first up is Andrea Amico on the topic of turf. Good evening, I'll speak super fast. Mayor, city council, city manager, the former city council approved an artificial turf that was PFAS free. The city staff and their consultants asserted the city the turf was PFAS free and the turf manufacturer wrote a letter stating the turf was PFAS free. I'm grateful the city spent money to conduct additional testing of the turf, but sadly that confirmed the presence of multiple PFAS in all components of the turf. We did not get a PFAS free turf. Where is the accountability from the city that we did not get the turf the city council approved? You should be upset about that, not minimizing and downplaying the PFAS in the turf. And more importantly, you should not be setting a precedent that a manufacturer can lie to you in writing without any consequences, because if that's the case, where will this end? Portsmouth was ground zero for PFAS back in 2014 at Pease. Thousands of people were exposed to PFAS, many of them residents and employees of the city. Our community has worked tirelessly and successfully for action. Portsmouth is seen as a leader on PFAS in a state in the state and across the nation. Voting to approve a PFAS free turf was a very good thing and aligns with the values of the work surrounding many in Portsmouth. However, turning around and now saying we will accept PFAS in our turf after finding it because the levels are low is frankly deplorable and insulting to me, my family and others who have been exposed to PFAS in the community and have fought tooth and nail for action. As for low levels and if they are safe, the EPA just announced they are setting health advisories for two common PFAS in the parts per quadrillion range to be protective of human health. Do you know what parts per quadrillion is? I had no clue. It's 10 to the minus 15, or easier put, 1 million billion. Think about that. I don't know how much lower levels we can get than parts per quadrillion, and that is coming from the EPA. Low levels of PFAS are not safe. We should not be normalizing that. And we should not be taken lightly by any, no one in this city should be taking it lightly. These low levels will bioaccumulate and will need to be cleaned up someday, which puts us, our city at risk for additional financial costs. I have so much more to say and I'm running out of time, so I'll leave you with my suggestions to the city now that we have a turf that is not PFAS free. Number one, place signs on tips for turf safety at the field. I've asked for this last year and again earlier this year. These are common sense tips developed by environmental health PD 
pediatricians. Other communities have done it. You can't take the PFAS from the turf, but you can educate the community on tips to use it safely. That seems like a no-brainer to me. Number two, set up a testing plan to monitor PFAS levels surrounding the turf. The EPA is starting to drop advisories on PFAS in the parts per quadrillion, one million billion. Let's get proactive here. Let's see what the PFAS levels are in the environment around the turf. And if we're adding an additional PFAS to our environment, we should be monitoring that closely. And to my last point, I hope you'll let me finish. Get upset. Show some outrage that your city has been already highly impacted by PFAS and was not given the PFAS free field they wanted. Write a strongly worded letter to the turf manufacturer and the people responsible for not being diligent to make you aware of the PFAS in the turf ahead of time. The turf company knew their PFAS, their turf was not PFAS free. They just weren't banking on you doing more advanced testing. Portsmouth is not the only community to be deceived by this billion dollar industry. Take a stance, get mad. Don't embolden the turf company who lied to you by feeding into the talk points that the levels are low and not harmful. You are giving them more ammunition to do this to another community. We should have known better in Portsmouth. We should have been more diligent. We weren't and our community will suffer the consequences for it. But put the people on notice who sold you a PFAS free turf that was not PFAS free so they can think twice before doing it to another community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Next up is Roy Helsel on the topic of land use boards and turf. Good evening, Roy Helsel, 777 Middle Road, Portsmouth. Wow, that was something. Anyway, I was going to say, at 17th of June, there were two articles in the paper about the same thing. And I'm wondering if the outfit that did the testing for us, which is TRC, if they used the new standard since the standard of 2016 was changed and it's much lower as the young lady stated. So that's all I have, is Mr. Rice could answer that, if it, what standard did they use for the testing this time? All right, the other thing is on the land use board. Why is it that the developers always get cups and variances on height mass variances and on wetland boundaries when the homeowner, like the Mahoney's on Lincoln Avenue, built a tree house that was abutting, and the abutting neighbors approved of it. But the city made them take it down and would not give them variances because they were not five feet from the boundary. Yet, the developers can enroach on the wetlands, they can build higher, they can build larger mass, but homeowners can't. Can you answer those questions? Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Roy. Uh, next up is Caroline uh, Ma McCoy. McCoy. Sorry, Caroline. Hi. Okay. I'm Caroline McCoy. I live at 757 State Street. And um, my husband and I initiated the petition to save our brick sidewalks. Um, over just two days in April, we got all of the signatures that we then delivered to the mayor. And I want to thank you, Mayor, and the City Council for taking the petition seriously and um, holding this hearing. I would also like to add that since we delivered the signatures in April, we've spoken to many more people in our neighborhood who also want to preserve the brick. We live in a section of State Street with many historic homes, but we are just outside the official historic district. The border of the historic district literally runs along the side of my house. Everyone can agree that brick sidewalks are more beautiful than concrete. That's why the city maintains them downtown and in the south end. The issue before us now is one of cost. Mayor McCackern emailed me the price differentials for the bids, and putting in new concrete sidewalks is cheaper. But replacing the brick with concrete is short-sighted. It is akin to urban improvement projects of the past that raised historic buildings only to replace them with eyesores. If you browse any of the Portsmouth, Portsmouth Facebook groups, you'll see posts lamenting such projects. We now look back and think, how could they imagine that this would be better? And I think the same is true of concrete now. The city is investing a lot of money and work in improving the Islington corridor to connect downtown to the West End. The brick sidewalks help to visually unify our neighborhood with downtown and the historic character and charm of our city. 
Even Islington comments that new development has brick sidewalks, as I'm sure the developers knew that this is an integral part of what makes Portsmouth unique. Put simply, concrete sidewalks look like any other suburban or urban neighborhood. Portsmouth, by contrast, invests, invests heavily in historic preservation, and I'm really glad it does. Um, tourists flock here in the summer months, in large part because of that attention to history and beauty, and they help our small businesses stay afloat. When we first heard of the city's sidewalk plan, I called the Department of Public Works, and I was told that the plan to replace the brick with concrete was made by the city council 12 years ago and was repeatedly assured that it was not a matter of cost, but rather one of safety. While brick sidewalks may freeze more quickly in winter, they were truly dangerous. They would be planning to rip them up in the south end in downtown, and they're not doing that. Um, the mayor also told me that uh, the West End was a different neighborhood back then and probably wasn't as well represented in the city council. I wasn't there. I don't know. Um, but now, the people of the West End, we care really deeply about keeping our brick. Um, our stretch of, is that the end? It is, if okay. you could wrap up. Okay, little. sure. So um, we're outside the official historic district, but you know we all pay the same tax rate, so why should we pay to maintain the South End, for example, and not our neighborhood? I'm not dissing the South End. I have a lot of friends who live there. I love that neighborhood. Um, but I, I just, I want the city to preserve the beauty and history of my neighborhood. I feel like it's, it's very short-sighted. Once the brick is gone, that's it. It's, it's not coming back. And, um, you know, I, I was also told that by the Department of Public Works that it's not just State Street, that's what they're doing now, but next is probably going to be Cabot or any of the brick that's outside of this historic district. Um, and, you know, if you really want to invest in the West End, I think the brick is a great place to start. I mean, it's, it's part of the charm and history. Um, and I'm really hoping that you will reverse the current policy and save our brick. Um, so... Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Trevor Risto. Is it five minutes Three minutes. Okay, boy. I just had dinner with, that was my wife, Caroline. We just had dinner before this, and I was like, let me see what you got. And we realized that we covered a lot of the same territory. So I probably should have written one speech and just switched at three minutes. <laughs> Anyway, like Caroline, I want to thank you for taking our petition to save our bricks into account and the work you've done to solicit the bids and for opening this discussion. Uh, my family has deep roots in, state, in uh, Portsmouth. I now live on State Street with my wife and two young sons. When we began inquiring about the city's plan to tear up the brick sidewalks and replace them with concrete, we were told more than once that it was not an issue of cost, but rather safety and policy. Like, like Caroline said, if, it was, if, if safety was the primary, uh, if you look around the city, you can see there's a lot of beautiful brick sidewalks. Obviously, they, this brick can be made acceptably safe, or you would be concreting the entire city, which I don't think is going to happen. So um, if, if, if bricks can, can be made acceptably safe, as they are in the south end, they're well maintained and they're preserved, if they can be made acceptably safe, and it's, it's not an issue of cost, then what, what, what we have left is city policy. And I've read the city policy. Thank you for putting it on the council website. Um, but if it's policy that's, that's the issue, then that's great, really great news for us because policy is made by people and we can change it. People can change it. The overwhelming majority of people of my neighbors, about, we've spoken to well over 150 people, they do not support the concreting of our neighborhood. There's about 450 feet of brick left on the part of State Street currently scheduled for improvement under this plan, 450 feet. The rest of the brick on State Street, there's a lot of brick on State Street, but the rest of the brick is protected by the historic district. So it's just a, a, a relatively tiny amount of brick, and I've measured it myself with a tape measure. That's 450 feet on both sides of the street. So it's 200 on one and 250 on the other, something like that. Uh, a lot of this brick doesn't need any work at all. The brick right outside of our house is perfect. I it literally doesn't need anything. And our petition just asked for this 450 feet of brick to be preserved and repaired where necessary. <clears throat> my wife mocked me for including Sir Roger Scruton in my speech, but I'm going to do it anyway. Sir Roger Scruton, who died a couple years ago, was the greatest philosopher of aesthetics since Aristotle, according to many people. He wrote a lot about city planning and beauty. And one of his most famous quotes is that beautiful things are not, quote, are not easily created but are easily destroyed. 
I don't know exactly when the West End lost its original brick sidewalks, but you can still see them in photos at the Athenaeum. They were as early as 1873. Bricks are part of our neighborhood, its history, and its character. Some other Portsmouth City Council about 40 years ago, from what I un understand, voted to lay the current bricks, the bricks that are there now. So the 1873 bricks, they were lost at some point in time. About 40 years ago, another city council voted to put in the bricks that are there now. Boy, whew. let me wrap it up. Um, in order to restore a little bit of the beauty of Portsmouth. I'll just get my, skip to my last paragraph. Sir Roger's other famous quote on city planning is, beauty is assailed by the cult of utility in everyday life. In many parts of the world, beauty is reserved for the wealthy, while others are asked to make do with simple utility. Our city is not immune to this inequity. Put simply, we in the West End have to make do with concrete, while other neighborhoods get to enjoy brick. There are no parking meters in the South End to raise funds to maintain their bricks, so their maintenance is paid for either out of tax revenue or parking revenue from a different neighborhood. I'm not exactly sure which. I think it was supposed to be in the report back, but I never read that or whatever. So. The, the South End's bricks are either maintained from tax revenue or parking revenue from downtown. The only distinction is that they are in the historic district, but for a lot of us on State Street, the historic district is like right there. It's, it's, it's either across the street or it's out the window. In our case, it's over the backyard fence is the historic district. Uh, so th those lines can seem pretty arbitrary to those of us now being asked to live with the destruction of our neighborhood sidewalks. I'm here today to ask you not to enforce this change against community opposition, but rather to decide to preserve and maintain these 450 feet of bricks, 450 feet of our city's beauty, where it already exists, already there. Thank you so much, and thank you for letting me finish. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, next up is uh, Vicki Fox David. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. My name is Vicki Fox David. My husband and I own the property at 39 Cabot Street. Like my neighbors, Trevor and Caroline, the historic district is along our property line, our southern property line, so we're that close. We purchased our house on Cabot Street in April 1994. 28 years ago. As you may know, our West End neighborhood at one time was called Austinboro in Richard Candy's book on Portsmouth neighborhoods. It's important in the history of Portsmouth. Austin Borough included Cabot Street, Austin Street, Union Streets, and some adjacent areas. The neighborhood was populated by 20 plus craftsmen and some African American families. It was developed by men with names that you will recognize like Rundlet, Boardman, and Marden. If you've not read this chapter of Mr. Candy's book, I encourage you to do so, it's quite interesting. Our home was built around 1810 by Benjamin Norris and his wife Sally. Mr. Norris was a privateer who spent time in a British prison and later was a rope walker on what is now Wybird Street. The homes in our neighborhood were built from the early 1800s, our home was built in 1810, through the late 1800s, although modest in their architecture, it is an historic neighborhood. 28 years ago when we bought our home, Cabot Street and the surrounding areas did not have curbs or sidewalks. Our 19th century shed abutting the sidewalk, if there had been one, was pushed at a severe angle as a result of multiple winters of snow plowing. Side note, that shed has been rebuilt in a uh, uh, restored in a beautiful way. Sidewalks and curbs were not a priority for the city 25 years ago, so the neighbors took matters into our own hands. We qualified for a community development block grant, wrote the grant, and received monies for materials and labor to install brick sidewalks and granite curbs. Those brick sidewalks and granite curbs were installed the length of Cabot Street from Middle to McDonough, plus several cross streets. No city monies were spent on that infrastructure, and none has been spent since. Again, we've owned that property for 28 years. The owners and residents in the West End neighborhood found the resources and executed to achieve brick sidewalks and granite curbs. As a result, pedestrians no longer have to walk in the street, and the historic homes that line the street are no longer threatened by snow plowing. We know the value these brick sidewalks bring to our neighborhood, 
retaining the existing brick sidewalks and granite curbs is something the city can do to retain the character of the neighborhood. I support that after 25 years of New Hampshire winters and a good it's a good use of capital expense to reset those curbs and refresh the sidewalk. We appreciate that investment. Do not replace brick sidewalks with 21st century concrete. If brick sidewalks are good enough for other neighborhoods, they're good enough for the West End. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. And again, clapping, we, we discourage in terms of if everybody's in agreement, we love it uh, as we had with the the kids uh, here, uh, but would ask you to hold your applause until you're uh, outside uh, City Council Chambers. Next up is Amy May Court and Dave Cosgrove with uh, the Skate Park Fundraiser. Do we get two, two sessions since it's two of us? Well, <laughs> you've, we'll you've see how long it your, takes. If you've split your speech, sure. Okay. Good evening. My name is Amy May Court. I live at 47 Taft Road. In tonight's agenda, you will be accepting money that was raised at Flip the Switch, the Skateboard Park Committee's fundraiser to light up the future skate park. As you will see later, we raised a bunch of money thanks to our incredible community. I'd personally like to acknowledge some of the folks seated before me that made this night truly legit. For those of you who couldn't make it, Mayor McEachran, Councillor Bagley, and Rec, uh, Director Todd Henley spoke at the mic, throwing their full support toward this project with passionate speeches about why a skate park in this city is important and how it will positively affect our community. Councillor Blaylock was there too. He was prominently featured in our community montage video. Councillor Denton was there, featured in our live auction. That makes it sound like we auctioned him off. We did not. <laughs> um, but. He certainly got into some intense bidding wars, as did Councillor Bagley for our um, Portsmouth-themed hand-painted skateboard decks. Councillor Cook was also in attendance, mingling and milling about at our silent auction table. Former councillors Kennedy and Huda showed up. Esther Kennedy got up to speak with a heartwarming introduction of Seamus Durkin, who we all know is the OG leader of this skate park movement. Before I turn the mic over to Dave, I'd like to share a text I received from an old friend the morning after the event. It says, thanks so much for what you did tonight. I drove back thinking of how much that will help the kids. They were all out skateboarding in front when I left. I loved it. Thanks, so good to see you. Your son is lucky he has you. I'm sharing this text with you because it should be for everyone, not just me. My son is lucky he has all of us. We will continue to fundraise, and these skateboarders and future skateboarders will have a safe, well-lit, beautiful skate park. Uh, before I leave again, just one more thing. Um, China, that is a GM over at the Wilder, reached out to me, and for the month of July on Wednesdays, 10% of all the drink sales are going to go to the skate park lights. So we should all go to the Wilder on Wednesday nights in July. Thank you, Amy May. Thank you, Amy. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council, City Leadership. Uh, in addition to thanking all of those who Amy mentioned, I'd like to thank a number of in, the ind individuals and businesses that donated items and services to our cause. In particular, I'd like to thank the PHS student artists for their contributions that were created under the guidance of their teacher, Eric Moore, at Portsmouth High School. Um, in addition, the professional artists donated their, their skills and time, varying ranging from auto body shop artists to expressive arts therapists to college professors, all willingly donated their time, passion, and skills, asking for nothing in return. So I'm extremely proud of, of everyone who contributed. I'd also like to thank our dedicated committee for making the event so successful, from procuring donations to selling raffle tickets that night. Everyone worked as a team to make the night successful. Um, we had to rely on members outside of our immediate committee, such as people like Sean McDonald of Rye, who screen printed several promotional posters ahead of the event, as well as during the evening for an interactive experience that we all enjoyed. He donated all of the proceeds to the skate park lighting. Um, also, given that none of us had ever put on such a sizable event, we leaned very heavily on someone with relevant experience, Anna Nuttall. She's a, a middle school art teacher and leader in our committee, in our community that um, I just can't thank enough. She selflessly spent countless hours putting together bid sheets, raffle boxes. She got young elementary school kids involved, had them 
color uh, paper skateboard decorations for the event. Somehow managed to do all of this while closing out the school year and, and educating our children. I could go on. So from the bottom of my heart, thanks to Anna. With all of that, I'm proudly here to report that we raised approximately $15,000 that evening uh, as part of that fundraiser. And that doesn't even include direct donations stemming from that event. And many of you before me are, are a big part of that. So thank you so much. Um, fundraising the money is certainly critical, but I think possibly even more important than that is, is just building community, gaining more momentum, and, and having really a memorable and fun evening. This was a, an event that was, I think, was a snapshot of the best of what the city can be when it decides to, to come together for a common purpose. On a closing note, by happenstance, I did notice Sunday night that there is an item on the docket tonight to hold a public hearing to fund the skate park in a manner that deviates from what was decided back in December as part of a 9-0 council vote. I'm sure there are important reasons for the shift, excuse me, and I look forward to hearing them. And I also hope that this perspective shift in funding does not alter the timeline nor the scope of, of the outdoor recreational space that we hope to build in the future. One final note, um, this is off script. I, like Andrea, you were at three minutes. Hey, hey. Give, me, give me 30 yeah, yeah, seconds. Yeah. Um, uh, off script, like Andrew and Miko, I am also a victim of PFAS contamination. I worked at PEAS for a number of years. My family is affected by it. Um, Andrew is a very rational, intelligent, caring, loving person. Uh, she's a friend of mine. I have a, the utmost respect for her. If she's angry, I guarantee you it's, it's for good reason. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Next up, uh, we have Olivia Anunziata Blaisdell and Emily Stokel uh, with the topic of Indigenous Peoples Day. And if you want more than three minutes, just split up your uh, time. You're good. All right. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Mayor McEachern and Council Members. My name is Olivia Nunziata Blaisdell. I'm an upcoming sophomore at Portsmouth High School and a member of the We Speak organization. And I'm Emily Stokel. I'm an upcoming junior at Portsmouth High School, and I'm the co-president of We Speak. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the city of Portsmouth is on the homelands of the Abenaki and Wabanaki people who have ongoing cultural and spiritual connections to this area. We are here to thank you all for reading the letter we sent on May 24th addressing the name change of Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day and supporting public recognitions and acknowledgments in honor of Indigenous Peoples lands and culture in Portsmouth. The current name, quote, Columbus slash Indigenous Peoples Day, end quote, is inadequate and insulting to the city's value of racial justice. We understand this issue cannot be voted on tonight, but we hope that you will find it important enough to put it to a vote at your next council meeting on July 11th. We Speak has been working on this issue for over two years now, and it is time for a change. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Plenty of time. Jeez. All right. Um, and I believe that is on the agenda. Uh, we, will pro we will schedule it for the next uh, meeting, so you don't have to. Well, please stick around if you'd like to. But um, next up is Peter Huda uh, with the topic of page 51 council packet. Good evening, Council, Mayor, Pedro Huda, 280 South Street. I'd like to call your attention and the attention of the Portsmouth taxpayers to page 51 in the packet. That is the approval of local 1386 memo of agreement. The city and the union are party, parties to a collective bargaining agreement that covers the period of July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2022. The dates mean you as a city council are amending the FY22 budget, which is an additional appropriation. The city manager is putting forward an amendment, which is an additional appropriation of an unknown amount to the taxpayers of Portsmouth, not included in the FY22 budget. This is a violation of the city charter section 7.14, which states any additional appropriations require a public hearing. I'm here to speak against the approval of this memo because it is against the city charter. 
I would like to read to you the section 7.14 for clarification. No appropriation shall be made for any purpose not included in the annual budget as adopted unless voted by a two-thirds majority of the council after a public hearing held to discuss said appropriation. The council shall by resolution designate the source of any money to be appropriated. At this point in time, we do not have an amount. There is only nine days left in this fiscal year. And the effect on this would be to have the future budgets and the collective bargaining agreements would automatically have a chance, would automatically be increased by the base rate. So your collective bargaining agreements would start, and if the dates are correct on this, you'll be negotiating a new one starting July 1st. So in order to do this, you have to increase all of the wastewater treatment um, as discussed in here. So the, the action in here would, um, would change everything, would change their base rate and they would start at a new base rate. So I would ask you to look at this and trust but verify City Council. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Uh, I don't see any hands no on Zoom. So uh, next up is a public hearing and vote on ordinance. Oh. Come on up. I'm used to doing Zoom calls in my underpants, um, <laughs> so, so I'll be I'll be quick. Um, I think. Sorry, I just need your name. My name's Bill Camarda. Um, Bennett and I live at 809 State Street. We just okay. bought. We moved in. Um, I think we provide a pretty interesting perspective. Um, have lived all around the country: um, Manhattan, Atlanta, Chicago. Working remote, we can live wherever we want. It's a really cool world. Um, we chose Portsmouth because it's Portsmouth. It's awesome, right? It has the charm. It's young, but it also has that history. There's so much to do. And every single time our friends come to visit, I walk down my steps. Everyone's blown away by the charm. I'm blown away every morning. The brick sidewalks, all the character. I feel like the downtown is right in my backyard. And we're not as close as some, but we're right there. And you know, where I've lived across the country, whether it's Atlanta, Chicago, New York, the best neighborhoods are the ones that you know, retain their charm, like the West Village or East Atlanta Village or Bucktown, Wicker Park in Chicago. And the ones that everyone really lament are the ones that add the, you know, <laughs> the cement sidewalks, right? Hudson Yards or uh, Pont City Market down in Atlanta. So I think for us, we just really want to maintain that charm. We moved here for a reason. We want to maintain the value of our neighborhood um, and raise kids in an area where we have brick sidewalks. You know, we're, we're Portsmouth. We're not any of these other towns around on the seacoast. Um, I think there's a lot of pride for where we live. And then more objectively, I think my frustration as well with getting rid of the brick is that Portsmouth loves its charm, right? We do everything to maintain it. I think we all know how hard it is to get a building permit or to build something new or some of the projects that have been held up for the sake of maintaining the aesthetics, but we're getting rid of one of the most tangible aesthetic pieces of the city, which is the West End brick sidewalks, right? It's just a little bit contradictory to me. Let's, let's keep it all, right? If, <laughs> it's really hard to add you know, what we want to our homes and to new developments for the aesthetic. Let, let's keep all the aesthetic and make sure it's consistent. That's all I have. Did I miss anything? All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Thank you, all. Bill. I appreciate it. Yeah. If there are no other speakers, um, I will move on to the public hearing and vote on ordinances and or resolutions. We have a first reading of two ordinances. First reading of ordinance amending chapter one, article four, section 1.413, trees and public greenery committee. Uh, I would await a sample motion moved to pass first reading and hold a public hearing and second reading at July 11th. 2022 City Council meeting. Your Honor, so moved. Second. Any discussion on that? And no presentation. So we will 
voting for this means that we will have at the next council meeting, we will schedule a public hearing uh, where we'll hear from the public on this um, as well. Uh, so I will have a roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McCachran? Yes. Unanimous? Next uh, ordinance, the first reading of ordinance amending chapter one, article eight, code of ethics. Sample motion moved to pass first reading and hold a public hearing and second reading at the July 11th, 2022 city council meeting. So moved. Second. Uh, and any discussion on that? Uh, Kelly, uh, will we please have a roll call vote? Sure. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McCachran? Yes. Unanimous. Next up, we have the city manager's items which require action. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. First up under city manager's items which require action is approval of a local 1386A memorandum of agreement. Um, by way of background, I would remind um, folks watching that this would allow the city more flexibility in hiring operators for our uh, uh, water treatment operators, wastewater treatment operators, and pump station operators. Uh, and this would uh, be, able to be able to give uh, us the ability to acknowledge uh, when they achieve their licensure commensurate, commensurate with their position and commensurate with the work they're doing. Um, to address something that uh, former Councillor Huda brought up, this would uh, take effect upon approval. There is no need for any additional appropriation. And to give you a sense <coughs> of what this, uh, we estimate this would cost out of the water fund, it would be, uh, we're talking about $13,000 out of a $12 million budget and out of the sewer fund, it represents $72,000 as far as we can estimate out of a $23 million budget. Happy to answer any questions. Councillor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, probably a question for the city manager or, or Director Rice. Could you speak a little bit to the complexity of the equipment that is being run and maintained by the personnel and what the cost would be if we didn't have qualified personnel to run it. Because um, I, I think the important thing to note here is spending a little bit of money to make sure that the equipment is maintained mm -hmm. could end up saving us quite a bit of money if something unfortunate was to happen. Sure. Thank you, Councillor. A good, good question. Very good question. Brian Getz, Deputy Director of Public Works. And um, as you know, uh, just last year we dedicated the uh, the wastewater treatment facility on Pierce Island, um, give or take $100 million worth of infrastructure, equipment. Um, those that toured the facility, or if you saw um, what you can still see on YouTube, uh, <clears throat> a virtual tour of the facility, very complex. And regulatory-wise, we have very strict uh, regulations. So it's 24-7 operation. Um, in the old days, you could have one person that kind of knew everything and could point fingers and, you know, have the rest of uh, the group, you know, do the work. But right now, you know, a 24-7 operation requires everyone that is, you know, on call and there to be fully aware of the in intricacies of the equipment and all that. Um, so that just speaks to the wastewater side. The water side is, is equally as complex and equally as... Um, respondent as far as what you need to do when you have high rate treatment and equipment. There's a lot of com computer controls, but that itself is not the panacea. I mean, it, you have to interpret the data and be able to respond. And then there's mechanical um, issues that can happen that, you know, the computers aren't able to fix. So, um, you know, a, an exact dollar amount on that is, is hard, to, hard to say, but certainly uh, cost avoidance is big. I mean, we we regularly have maintenance issues, things break down, pumps cost in the uh, thousands of dollars. So having um, staff that might be able to catch things ahead of time um, is very important. And again, uh, the regulatory complexity of these and the, the uh, 
regulatory uh, standards we have to meet are uh, very stringent, and you know to get staff that are able to to operate to that level is uh, is very important to us. Thank you, Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I actually have a follow-on question. Are we having any challenges around hiring qualified staff or keeping qualified staff? Uh, yeah, the challenges, the, the biggest challenge is, is the hiring um, because the wage um, is, uh, we've got surrounding communities that have upped their wages. Um, they too are having difficulty. It's not our intent to have to go try to steal from a neighboring community um, but the uh, the talent pool is is not a huge um, amount, and part of that, when you talk to people, it's the you know point of entry as far as wage goes. Well, gee, you know, if I could just work a regular job and not have all this responsibility, um, why would I take this on? And um, you know, we have great staff, the staff we do have, but we currently have four openings. They're across board. And we have two retirements pending, so that's uh, um, six employees, um, and these facilities aren't, we're not overstaffed, that's for sure. So um, certainly um, we believe with uh, this MOA we're going to be more competitive, it's going to be more attractive. Uh, we do hope to, you know, get entry-level people that want to make a career out of it, and this, this too would, would help in that respect. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Moreau and then Councilor um, Tabor. A lot of questions. <laughs> Just to uh, confirm that I'm right and, and correct me if I'm wrong, City Manager, but the increases for this are already stated for in our budgets. We're not actually increasing overall spending, even though it's a slight change in spending. So therefore, we didn't need to have a public hearing as, as has been previously mentioned. That is correct. Councilor Tabor. Oh, I was just going to say I was going to vote for this because I think we have to realize we have to pay commensurate with the skills needed with a $95 million sewer plant that runs 24-7 and takes a high degree of skill and all of our operators go through training for this and that's part of the compensation. And also, as you mentioned, um, you know, how do you, how do you increase your pay? Well, you can go into management, be on that track in the long run, or we can create financial recognition of highly skilled operators. And I think that's a way to recruit and retain that will do a service well in the long run. Thank you. Councilor Lombardi. Yeah, I would also add that the other side of the water, the, the fresh water, um, is also very technical. Um, and um, we are uh, coming up with uh, improvements to the Pease um, uh, wells and um, other, other facilities that require that kind of skill as well. So just add that to it. Councilor Lombardi, any other questions or comments? All right. Do we have a motion on the floor? Kelly, do we have a motion on the floor? No. We don't. Uh, no. So I will await the sample motion to approve the proposed memorandum of agreement with Local 1386A as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, I caught somebody in the audience, and since this is something that I, I was hoping we could suspend the rules, we'll get to the sidewalks in two seconds, but uh, would love uh, to suspend the rules and bring forth Section D. 16D. Uh, 16D, approval of grants, donations, acceptance of a memorial donation in memory of Vernon Boardman of $2,200. Um, we could suspend the rules. So moved, Your Honor. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Vern was a, a, a great friend to many people in Portsmouth and a fixture of the downtown. It is an honor to accept uh, this donation. Uh, and if um, uh, former Council Pearson would like to come and, and say anything, 
on behalf of uh, <laughs> Vernon, would love for folks that, that might not have known him to learn a little about him um, and to, to highlight this, this great donation. Thank you, Your Honor. I would love to talk about Ver Vernon. I'm too short. Um, <coughs> hello, everybody. Nice to see you. It's so nice to be back here. I haven't been in this room since 2019. Um, so I, as all of you know, um, Vernon, our friend Vernon Boardman, who is a fixture in Portsmouth and was a fixture in our downtown, passed away during COVID, sadly. And um, he was texting me and calling me right up, right up until the end. And um, Vernon was a new but, but wonderful friend. I used to bake Swedish goods for him, Swedish meatballs and Swedish breads, and I'd bring him pesto from my garden. And I would deliver him uh, where he lived with his father, all those goodies at the Keefe house. And um, so I got to know him and his dad and a few of his friends and people that know the family. So there was a lot of conversation after Vernon passed about a bench, but there wasn't, didn't seem to be anybody taking the reins on that. So I just decided to to go ahead and, and figure something out. And I'm so thankful because Tom Caulfield, who organized um, Charlie Howard's memorial benches at the high school and also in Commercial Alley, reached out to me and wanted to know if I thought it would be a good idea to put their benches together. They were both uh, of the same generation. They both went to Portsmouth High School around the same time, both members of the LBGTQ community. And um, so, Tom actually coordinated with the city and the DPW to redesign uh, and re-landscape Commercial Alley. We met with Peter Rice a few times, and it's a wonderful um, development because now the alley has no curbs in it and it's accessible, and I think that's a really important thing because, as you know, Vernon um, had accessibility issues, and I know a couple of you sitting on the Dias right now, um, he frequented, frequented your establishments, and I know Councillor Blaylock was very helpful in, in getting Vernon from point A to point B, and sometimes even delivering him his meals when he could no longer come, come all the way down to the, to the tugboats um, and to the ferry landings. So uh, he touched so many of us. So um, the bench will be um, going in and in Commercial Alley with, with Charlie's, and it's not going to be the typical wooden bench that the city has around the, the town where we commission these benches through a granite company and Vernon's is going to look um, just like the one that's in Commercial Alley right now. It's going to match Charlie's. And so um, there will be a commemoration for Charlie's bench on July 11th starting at the South Church and there'll be a procession to Commercial Alley and after we've properly and finally um, honored Charlie, then I will hopefully by then have the, uh, the cost and, and I will launch a GoFundMe campaign to raise money for Vernon's bench and then depending on how that goes and, and when everything is um, fabricated, then I will contact um, Peter Rice and we'll get Vernon's bench installed, and I'm sure too much fanfare as he deserves. Thank you, Nancy. Okay. That's great. Um, so back to the regular scheduled uh, program we got. We need a motion to accept the donation. Oh, yeah, let's, let's do that. All right, so uh, uh, we need a motion to accept uh, the generous donation of $2,200. So moved, John. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Your Honor. I'd also like to move to spend the rules to bring forward item 13B, which is the We Speak request. Is there a second? Second, Your Honor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Bear with me, I will pull up that motion. I believe the sample motion is to move to refer this request for a vote at the July 11th, 2022 council meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. That will happen July 11th. Now back to the. We got two, and then the two quick ones, I think, and then the uh, the sidewalks are are up next. Thanks, Mayor. Although we've been trying to postpone having this conversation, uh, this is to acknowledge the extension of uh, retiring Fire Chief uh, Chief Todd Germain's contract. 
uh, initially set to ex uh, expire at the end of June. This would extend this to August 31st so that uh, he may continue to serve the city until that time. So it's re with regret that we move this request forward, but at least we get them for a few more days. All right, so the uh, a sample motion is moved to approve the proposed extension with Fire Chief Chief Germain uh, as presented. So Second. moved, Your Honor. Second. And if we vote against this, that means he has to stay? <laughs> no, I think that means he has to go. Oh, okay, so we, gotta, <laughs> so we have to vote for it in order to, to, to keep him even just a little bit longer. Okay, uh, yes, it's with a heavy heart that I'll be voting uh, in favor of this. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Um, Next up is item number three, and this can be taken in conjunction with item 13D, underwritten communications in your packet. Uh, essentially, as a reminder to the council, this item came before you on May 2nd, and uh, it was voted to send to the planning board for a report back and recommendation. So at their May 19th council, uh, planning board meeting, the board voted to recommend that the council take the step to apply for an urbanized shoreland exemption per, uh, pursuant to RSA 483B12 for the property located at 57 Salter Street. It's important to note that New Hampshire DES staff have indicated that while they consider this site specific request for an exemption, it is their preference that the city apply for the broader area of wide exemption contemplated by the statute and believe that this should be the subject of further discussions between the city and New Hampshire DES. So if the council approves this application, the applicant will be asked to prepare the application for council review and submittal to the state. And uh, the motion um, is important here because we need to include a finding for the language that um, is what is required of the process. Okay, so I'm looking uh, to motion that the city council find that the 57 Salter Street property meets the criteria for an urbanized shoreland exemption pursuant to RSA 38483-B. Uh, colon 12 as outlined in the April 25th, 2022 and June 10th, 2022 letters and attachments submitted by the Thompson's legal counsel and included in the city council packet and further to authorize the city manager to submit an exemption application consistent with this finding. So moved. Second, Your Honor. Um, any discussion? Councilor Cook. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think this request from the state for us to for this city council and the city of Portsmouth to look at a broader um, policy here with regard to requests for an exemption for the area is really critical. And, and the reason that I say that is there are a lot of properties that abut um, the water in Portsmouth. Many of them um, have water encroachment already. And as that increases, we're gonna see more and more properties that no longer, with changes or additions no longer meet the current RSA requirements. And New Hampshire DES is going to continually say, you don't meet the standards for a permit now, even though you did before, because you have more water encroachment and erosion. So we need to be thinking very seriously as a city, looking at all the areas in the city that have this level of encroachment. Now in this case, it's a little bit different. The property was designed to be over water initially, but I can see um, in the near future this being a problem on Mechanic Street for the commercial businesses that are there. Thank you, Councilor Cook. Any other comments? I would just add to that that it does seem like, um, you know, while we should be taking a, a, a broader look and would look probably to the Planning Board to start that process, um, you know, we, we don't want to hold up uh, uh, 57 Salter Street in that broader process, but would look to, to hopefully have the planning board come back to us with uh, something to the effect of, you know, not choosing individual properties, but making sure that we're making it, um, you know, a, a more uh, blanket decision. But any more discussion, Councillor Tabor? Um, well, this is obviously the most, the best researched lobster shack in Portsmouth history. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but I think in that process, we've uncovered that this is an urbanized area along uh, Mechanic Street and, and Salter Street. Um, I think we've, number one, got the, the planning board recommending we approve this eight to one in their vote. Number two, uh, this meets all the requirements. And number three, I think the applicants are willing to move the, the, uh, the building back to, to further accommodate. So. 
Uh, I think it's a sound vote, and uh, I echo the sentiments that we do need to hear from a deeper look into what this means for that area of waterfront since it meets the urbanization requirements. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next up. Oh, I'm still in your thunder there. That's okay. Yeah, I'm about to hand it right back to you, Mayor. Um, this is a conversation about uh, sidewalks, and to reiterate to, to those paying attention, uh, the current City Council policy, uh, number 2010-02, <clears throat> prescribes sidewalk materials to be brick in the historic district of the city and concrete in all other sections. The Council policy further allows for sidewalk material for sidewalks located outside of the historic district, which have historically been brick, to be allowed based on a vote of the City Council and that the additional cost for the variance be paid by the benefiting parties. Um, based on the resident's request, the city staff structured the bid to be able to review the cost impact of selecting brick or a brick accent similar to what has been installed in the Islington Street corridor as opposed to concrete. So uh, here to share the information uh, that came back from the bids, the city received bids for the sidewalk project on June 14th. The base bid for concrete sidewalks was $396,225. The bid alternate for brick in lieu of concrete was an additional $135,300, or approximately 30% of the project cost. The bid alternative for brick accent was an additional $39,600, I'm sorry, $760, approximately 10% of the project cost. I think I'll stop there. I know there are plenty of questions that the council may have, and. Uh, Public Works Director Peter Rice is here to, to speak to this matter further. Um, it's a challenging policy decision. Peter, do you have some prepared uh, remarks? Are you here to answer I questions? I do not. All right, uh, uh, then I'll go to Council oh. Moreau. And you stay, you stay put. I oh, think yeah. there's questions to, <laughs> to you, Peter. It's not, I'm not answering <laughs> these. I got some thoughts, but we'll get you to. So to try to think outside the box, a lot of people have talked about the brick sidewalks that are existing, that the brick's in really good condition. So what would it be even possible to just relay what's there to reconstruct you know, the base and just put the brick back there? And would that be less money? I'm assuming the quote that we got was for all new bricks to be installed. It is, but the, the cost is really not the brick itself. It's the labor associated with it. So okay. picking the bricks up and then putting them back down uh, would be more expensive. Uh, we actually tried this back, uh, one of our staff members reminded us that we tried this once before, and it was significantly more expensive. Okay. Um, we also like to go with a newer brick material. It holds up better. Uh, it's, it's less slippery. Uh, some of the concerns that have been raised relative to safety are related to the old water struck brick, and it's a, it was a, actually a building brick uh, for buildings, and they had, when they had leftover bricks from when they built that, the building, the structure, they threw them down as uh, pavers on the sidewalk. Um, We've learned over time that those don't hold up as well um, as the, the uh, what they call pavers. Um, so they, the, the movement away from that water struck uh, classical brick uh, has been um, an improvement in the, in the durability of the bricks. Great, thank you. Uh, Councilor Bagley. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. So I took a much deeper dive into brick sidewalks than I ever expected to. Um, I, I had originally thought that maybe what we did on Islington Street with the brick inlay made the most sense because uh, from a cost perspective, it's not so bad. And talking to people um, with accessibility issues, the, the preference seems to be overwhelmingly for concrete. But then when I took a, a deeper dive into it, uh, kind of to Director Rice's point, if you use the right bricks in the, the right method, the the challenges aren't as great as they, they would be with with other bricks or bricks that have been used previously. So it does sound, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that we can make a pretty safe sidewalk out of bricks. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's, it's safety, the, the safety is a concern related to the older style brick that does freeze up more quickly um, than the concrete. Um, the newer style paver uh, is less susceptible to that. Um, it still does have a differential that it freezes a little quicker. Uh, but, you know, through maintenance and salting and things like that, we were able to, to maintain a safe surface. Thank you. And I, just to follow up, I, I have concrete sidewalks in front of my house, so um, my bias is, is not there. But I did talk to a number of people <coughs> about this, not just in the neighborhood, but um, who have brick sidewalks in front of their house. And every single person said, you know, if, if I had brick sidewalks in front of my house and 
the city replaced them with concrete, I'd, I'd be pretty upset about it. So um, I think it's, we probably don't want to be putting brick where it doesn't exist already, but we should think very carefully about eliminating where it, it does exist. Your Honor. Assistant Mayor, and then Councilor Denton. Thank you. Director Rice, obviously, um, if we did the brick, it's, it's, an ex, it's an extreme percentage of the overall project. Are there projects that we would have to delay or remove um, from this upcoming calendar year to supplement this money? It would, um, it will impact the, our ability to do additional, uh, more sidewalks. Uh, at this point, there is adequate funds uh, to be able to address the additional cost. Um, however, um, given the pricing uh, and escalation of costs, um, it's you know it just means that a, a next project will be truncated or we'll have to uh, put it off until there's available funds. Thank you, Councilor Denton. Thank you. I have a process question either for you, Peter, or the city manager. When it comes to spending additional money, would we need a public hearing on that, or can we simply make a vote tonight? The the council appropriated um, monies to do sidewalks. They they identify a backlog of sidewalks. In addition, it identifies miscellaneous. It doesn't identify a specific dollar value uh, per project, uh, and for a specific reason, because the costs uh, escalate, they change, and and council priorities adjust. Um, so, or the length of a project gets a little longer because something got added. Um, so, and the fact that the change in material, things like that happen. So the, the, the CIP is structured uh, to allow flexibility. Thank you. Um, Councilor Tabor, first bite of the apple, I think, and then the assistant mayor. Um, questions, Peter. Um, the quote that you have for brick of 135,000, is that for the entire length of State Street or just union to? It's uh, union middle. to the um, to the Farrell Funeral Home and to the um, where it ends off in front of Goodwin Park. Okay, so it is limited. It stops at union and there's a, there'd be a section of concrete. Right. And in terms of how we're funding this, um, this is done through bonding, right? Yeah, it's previously bonded uh, sidewalk monies, which was identified right. in um, 2020. So we, we go out and we bond this to pay over 20 years, so it's really in the order of $7,000 a year or something for if we were to pay $135,000 over I 20 years. have to run the amortization. I don't have it at the top of my head. Well, I guess what I was trying to get at is, is uh, the, the, the amount that would burden the taxpayer is, is spread out over 20 years as opposed Correct. to um, an immediate hit. Um, and I, I share the sentiment that, you know, it's hard to go from a brick sidewalk, which adds to the character, and particularly in the 500 to 700 block, there's some very nice historic houses there. Uh, it's hard to go backwards. So, you know, I think of what's best for the city, and um, to me, what's best for the city is keeping neighborhood character as much as we can. Assistant Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Director Rice, you may be able to answer this, but this may go to city manager. Uh, based on the policy, um, it's listed that additional costs would be paid for by the benefit and parties. Have we ever done that? Yes. Yes. And do we know how often or kind of what the scale of On that? a regular basis. <laughs> but oftentimes, um, they are in areas outside, clearly outside of the historic district. Mm -hmm. um, so. We have had situations like this. Um, I can uh, think of a couple where we were on the right on the border of the historic district. Uh, with the, actually, the last time we revisited this policy was at that time, um, and you know it, it's a it's a challenging um, policy. Uh, it's very hard from our perspective to tell residents that you know sorry, um, you're not going to be getting what you wanted, uh, or you'd need to participate financially if you if you wanted an alternative material. Um, it oftentimes isn't received well. Thank you. I think it's um, worth noting that we we all up here know how difficult sidewalks are, and um, it's a very sensitive topic in many neighborhoods. There's are plenty of neighborhoods, including Maple Haven and um, Panaway, that you know their sidewalk projects just got moved back. Um, so I think that you know 
in all fairness, I, I know it was referenced a lot comparative to the South End, but there are other neighborhoods, you know, that don't have really any sidewalks. They have torn up asphalt or tree roots. And so I think um, overall as a community, I ask that we be mindful of, of when we compare neighborhoods to neighborhoods. That's all, thank you. Uh, Councilor Cook. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I think I live in the South End. So um, we generally have brick sidewalks, except my street that's not wide enough to have a sidewalk. Um, one of the reasons I moved to the South End was because of the character of the neighborhood. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons I moved to Portsmouth. Um, I used to live in Exeter. And um, I moved not too long after the town of Exeter voted down brick sidewalks for the downtown because it struck me that I'd had different preferences as far as historic preservation and um, caring for kind of preserving that character of, of history within a town. And Portsmouth had strong provisions to protect the historic nature of the city. The brick sidewalks is one of those things. Um, I think I made this suggestion the last time this was raised, but do we have a process at all to look at this neighborhood and reconsider its designation beyond what it's currently designated as far as historic district? I know that that's a long process, but um, with the changing character of the neighborhood, do we have that in place right now? Any process? I, I can't speak to that. Um, I know that the policy as it's written allows for sections that are not within the historic district. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be a council policy to expand the policy. I'm not sure what it would take to expand the historic district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Suzanne, or yeah. Deputy City Attorney, Deputy City Manager. Yeah. Um, so just to follow up on Peter's comment, the, the easy change to make, so-called easy, is for the City Council to decide to amend the current City Council policy for what we do and how we look at sidewalks, because that's really a, a single vote. Um, and you could look at, you know, thoughtfully how you might want to redraft it. and could come back and, and look at that. Um, obviously, if you're going to make a change to the historic district, that is a longer process through the land use boards. Um, so you've got your, your you know, shorter route to accomplish a limited scope of do you want to revisit your sidewalk policy? And we could, you know, prepare additional information on that on, you know, what that change in policy could look like. I guess the real question is how soon do you need an answer to be able to start the project? We need the answer uh, this evening. That's, uh, we, the project needs to be awarded um, if we are going to move forward. Councillor, oh, sorry, Councillor Denton and Councillor Bagley. Thank you. Uh, Peter, if I heard you correctly just now, the $135,000 additional money would be for brick from the funeral home down to Goodwin Park. and. I could, I could clarify. It's from the funeral home down to Union. Thank you. On either side of the street. That's because I know uh, two of the speakers, and one of the speakers live between Cabot and Union, so I want to make sure that would go until Union Street. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any follow up to that? No. Nope. Councillor Bagley? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to take a stab at a motion. Um, I move that we approve brick sidewalks as presented tonight and motion that we revisit the sidewalk policy after a report back from staff. Second. One clarification or, or question would be to, the policy as it's written now says the benefiting party would pay. Was your um, motion to not require that? My motion was to not require that. I don't think we have enough time. I, I agree. That's my, that was my. The reason so the city I was would asking. be funding this yes. one time. So to restate, uh, or to make sure I have the the motion you've stated to uh, uh, to approve uh, brick sidewalks uh, for this section, 
uh, in this instance, uh, and also uh, brick sidewalks uh, for this project uh, without the requirement of residential payment uh, and to look uh, at the city council policy regarding sidewalks. That's correct. Yeah. Does that have a second? I second it. Assistant Mayor? Yeah, can, is, is it possible, I guess, a friendly amendment to split those instead of having them as a conjoined motion? Sure. Uh, let's was, let's oh. take the first then, and we'll have a we'll have a separate discussion. Um, let's uh, can we take up the the I think I know where this is going. Can we take up the motion to uh, look at uh, move to revisit the city council policy with regards to sidewalks? Yes. Okay. Is that a second? Yes. Any discussion? I'll just add on that I think that this policy is uh, um, it's it's difficult to, to digest that we would uh, simply require uh, folks to rally the troops around something uh, it's also very uh, around brick sidewalks um, it's also just um, as written gives no real mechanism for the city uh, to raise the monies if we wanted to do so um, so I think for both of those reasons it's it's time to um, kick this to the governance committee and come back with a um, so if we could add that to, or to revisit it and look at it to the governance committee to to figure out a better way um, to have this I think there's more equitable solutions out there uh, that take into the account of what the assistant mayor is that many people are clamoring for sidewalks and while the material is is one aspect of that it's will and that it's it's also difficult to approve something uh, uh, potentially tonight that says we are spending more money on these sidewalks than than other sidewalks so oh councilor Lombardi yeah I um, and this is on the motion sorry about the policy about the policy um, well I would speak to it this way then um, there was a time when we had a historic district B and um, it was less strict um, but it, it encompassed areas of the city that um, had historic character um, and it was uh, it was cumbersome for the historic district commission but um, I just wonder if there is you know if we are looking at changing or could change the historic district ordinance um, maybe that's a way to look at at this Thank you, Councillor Lombardi. I think that um, if if we send this policy towards the uh, the governance committee, um, that could be one of the recommendations back to the um, the city council in terms of looking at that. Councillor Bagley, I'll just add quickly because it's come up several times. Um, thank you, Your Honor. I would not be in favor of expanding the historic district. I it sounds like it's very challenging for people that live in that district to. Do work on their houses so I don't want to take too bite of an too big of a bite at this apple we're talking about sidewalks I don't want it to turn it into a discussion about windows that's just my personal preference and we're not there yet we're still talking about sidewalks and that's going to the but um, the governance committee will come back with a recommendation if there are no other comments on that I will um, I will uh, all in favor aye. aye any opposed okay so next motion I look for is to approve uh, without uh, residential payment uh, for a brick uh, on the section identified uh, by the city manager so moved second okay any discussion on that Councillor Cook uh, thank you mayor um, so I want to make sure that um, I know exactly what is getting bricked versus where we're starting um, concrete sidewalks because I have a little bit of a concern about doing partial brick partial concrete because if we don't revisit this for 20 years say or 30 years until we need new sidewalks then we've got half and half the the block to block will be complete okay. we're not going to stop mid block okay. Councillor Tabor yeah I just one thing to support this motion um, when I look at 
some of the streets where we have upgraded sidewalks, like Miller Avenue, uh, we tend to get higher valuations over time. Um, so we build our property tax base. And I, so short term, we, we may be concerned about this money, but if you look at long term, how quality improvements to a neighborhood work, I think this may pay for itself. I'm sure Roseanne is looking at this in terms of, you know, if we're not seeing anybody uh, coming in on if we approve the sidewalks or abatements, I'm sure. <laughs> That's true. Any, any other questions, Councilor Baila? Uh Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm, I'm very mindful when it comes to this subject of, you know, what exists there when you bought your home, when you purchased your home. Obviously, you purchased your home for a reason. Um, you purchased that home in that neighborhood for a reason. Um, I guess my other biggest concern on this is being fair to all the neighborhoods. Um, I'm also on, I'm on the, I'm the representative on the Historic District Commission, and um, and yes, those the, the houses in the Historic District Commission, they get brick sidewalks. They also have to jump through a lot of hoops and permits and such to do any work on their house. Uh, it might add to the cost of projects. Um, it couldn't be inconvenient. Um, so they, they get some benefit, but they also um, have to kind of have get some more challenges to come with it. Um, and I understand this is very close to the historic district, um, and it's in a very attractive neighborhood. I mean, all our, our neighborhoods are attractive. Um, <laughs> but I don't want to uh, not think about every other neighborhood when I'm thinking about this neighborhood. Um, as a representative of the town, I have to think of everyone equally. I have to represent everyone equally. Um, so that's just my biggest concern. Thanks, Councilor Bell. Councilor Lombardi, and then Councilor Denton. Yeah, I would I would add to that that um, it's a street that has brick already, and um, I think that is a uh, that's a different situation I think from a street that never had brick or doesn't have brick. Um, so it's um, I'm sympathetic to what our residents have said from State Street about that. Councilor Denton. Thank you, A uh, couple comments and a question for Peter. Um, although my neighbors probably don't recognize me in a suit and without my dogs, I've lived in this neighborhood for four years and walked these sidewalks uh, with those dogs for the duration of the time. And it's always uh, confounded me how it would go from brick to pavement to brick to pavement. It never made much sense. I really didn't put much thought into it before this petition was brought forward. Uh, one thing which continually came up is the section which has already been uh, concreted, if that's now a verb, from Cass to Columbus. That section there for years never got plowed. And whether it be the prior two years when I was off the council, the two years before that I was on the council, when I lived in that neighborhood, I was always asked how come that hadn't been plowed yet. And I always thought it had something to do with the sidewalks condition. And now that it's been uh, done with concrete, it, I'm fairly certain it's going to get plowed. So that's one benefit to concrete. And Peter, I was pleased to hear that you said that you could actually do brick almost as good as concrete when it comes to things like plowing and upkeep. But the, with all that said, my remaining question is for the section of street from uh, Columbia or Columbus, whichever one it is, to Union, which I believe is going to be done next. Is that going to be concrete with the grass, or is it going to be, can we do concrete with the accents? It is concrete. Uh, it's concrete. So, you know, if the council directs us to do concrete with, uh, it wasn't intended to be uh, accent on it. It was intended to be just concrete. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Councilor Cook. Thank you, Mayor. Um, have we looked at expanding the Islington Street District to include this area so that we can qualify for special grant funding or TIF funding, or have we looked at any um, community development grants like they did for Cabot Street for sidewalks? We have not in this instance. Um, I w I've not been around for when we may have used CDBG funds for this 
but Peter, I'm, I'm drawing on your memories. She, she left. But um, the, the community has changed significantly. Uh, it is gentrified, and areas that were previously uh, qualifying for CDBG monies do no longer. Uh, and, and actually, shortly after the brick sidewalks went in, uh, Cabot Street fell off that uh, that list. Designated uh, the, the, census block. Yeah, the McDonough Street area was probably the last area. Um, in this in the central downtown, Atlantic Heights was there for a while. Uh, so we did a lot of work using CDBG money uh, throughout the city, uh, but the census blocks um, that were eligible have really, for the most part, um, you know, gone away with the, the improvements throughout the city. No other questions? No other comments? Um, I, I will uh, state that I will support the, the amendment uh, to, uh, uh, to keep the, the brick. I think that uh, this is a result of uh, terrible city council policy for no fault of city councils previously, but I just, I dislike the idea that you have to, um, it's unless the city council decides otherwise, um, which just sets a, a, a bad precedent. We should decide as a city, do we want to keep uh, the, the, the bricks and the expense or not? Um, and then secondly, you know, the historic charm, I am, I am probably, in the minority, but you know, um, I think the character of Portsmouth is our people. Um, it's not our buildings, but it's uh, difficult to uh, state that when you're walking down a brick sidewalk, it seems kind of cool. Um, I don't have sidewalks um, in my neighborhood, so um, but the the portion of my house uh, that has a walkway out to the curb, it's brick, and then the city section is a little bit of asphalt. Um, you know, I probably do that too. I do think that in the future we need to figure out a way uh, to fund this um, uh, more equitably. Um, I think that is a, a perfectly valid reason uh, not to support uh, these sidewalks uh, and not to, uh, to spend um, the money to do so because there are other needs uh, in the city. Um, but I've been impressed with the number of people that have taken uh, the time uh, to focus on this. I've been impressed with the, um, the eloquency. I, frankly impressed that I learned today uh, that the sidewalks went in through uh, some some fundraising um, you know uh, to start with so um, I will be supporting this uh, I understand the reasons uh, not to and given the uh, the, the many uh, priorities that we have in, in the city uh, but uh, you know I was I read a quote the other day and, and it stuck with me that beautiful cities were rich in the 1800s and poor in the 1900s um, so they built a lot of great buildings and they didn't have the money to replace all those great buildings. Um, I think that could apply uh, to Portsmouth and that um, we have a lot of character um, and a lot of what makes us unique. And uh, for that reason, uh, I will be supporting this. So Kelly, uh, would you please uh, have a roll call vote on this? Yes. Assistant Mayor Kelly? No. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McCachran? Yes. Motion passes 8 to 1. Thank you. Welcome. Next up we have number 5, request for a public hearing at the uh, July 11th, 2022 City Council meeting. Uh, the request would be to set up and establish that data for a public hearing regarding various bonding resolutions for projects to begin in the next fiscal year. It would be a reminder to this council that all of the items to be to seek bonding resolution and authorization are in the FY23 capital improvement plan with the exception of the skate park which is technically an FY24 but for which we would seek an authorization so that when the design is ready and we can take advantage of um, the potential um, environment to, to go f out to bonding, we would be ready to go. We wouldn't miss any, we wouldn't skip a beat with regard to timing. Uh, so that's the one nuance in this list of otherwise FY23 projects. So uh, staff will be on hand to provide any additional information and answer questions at the July 11th meeting if it were the will of the council to hold the public hearing. 
I await a sample motion to uh, move to authorize the city manager to bring back for public hearing and adoption the various proposed CIP project as presented for the July 11th, 2022 city council meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Bagley. I'll, I'll just uh, re reiterate the city manager's comments. Um, the reason it's structured the way it is to give us that flexibility we need to keep that skate park um, moving forward as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Cook, were you going to say something about the? Um, I have a question about um, when we address this uh, at our next meeting. Um, there is funding in the first resolution for uh, field, uh, artificial turf field at the school facility, replacement of that field. Um, this is just the appropriation for the bonding. This isn't necessarily the approval for that item, is it? That is correct. It, 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 it allows for us to, to have uh, the bonding authorization in place when the council and, and the, the staff agree to move forward with the project. So a follow-up there. So there will be another opportunity for the council to discuss whether or not we should be replacing that field with an artificial turf field. I believe it would go to the school board first and then to the council. I'm looking for guidance from the attorney on that. Um, I believe both the school board and the recreation uh, board have already uh, indicated that their preference is for an artificial turf field in order to maintain the programming. And because the base is the site, if you will, is already set up for an artificial turf field, so you actually have a more expensive project, a significantly more expensive, as I understand from Kenny Lynchy, um, if you were to do a, a natural grass field. Okay. So. Councillor Dunn. Thank you, Your Honor. Building off Councillor Cook's question, the um, couple of years back on the council, I had tried and failed an 8 to 1 vote against me to do a grass field. But what the council had done for the field in question is we had put a bid alternate out there for an organic turf field whether it be coconut, walnut, things which kind of made me giggle at the time because who would have thought that was possible. But um, one thing which I would like the city to consider is possibly doing a uh, bid alternate option like that for something else. Which we did f uh, in similar fashion for the, the new field uh, campus drive. Yes. Any other questions or comments on the request for public hearing, uh, the, the motion on the floor of the CIP projects? No. Uh, there will be other opportunities to discuss the field uh, or fields at that point, bid alternatives, um, walnuts um, is what was in there as opposed to crumb rubber. Um, you know, we did find, you know, from the testing, maybe we discuss that later, but the, the testing for the walnuts also showed elevations of PFAS in that organic material that is non, um, but we haven't tested crumb rubber um, and there were concerns around crumb rubber before, um, but I think we will have a broader conversation around that. But again, this is for the CIP, uh, the bonding. So all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. On to number six, Mayor, which is a license extension request by Dagny Taggart. LLC for a license to erect pass-through staging over city sidewalks along Penhallow and Daniel Street that abut the 60 Penhallow Street or Brick Market project. I'll mention at the outset that developer Mark McNabb is here to answer any questions. This council uh, may recall having granted the third extension for use of sidewalks and parking spaces along Penhallow and Daniel. And um, since that time, the city's chief building inspector, Shanti Wolf, who is available on Zoom, has had weekly site visits along with other key staff members uh, to keep abreast of the project's progress. And it's important to note that the original license request that came in f to be considered this evening was to extend that existing license and continue to encumber parking spaces and the sidewalk. City staff raised concerns about this request and was able to work successfully, we think, um, in a compromise type fashion with the owner who's agreed to revise um, and really write reprioritize tasks to address the city's concerns which ended up freeing up parking 
and allowing for public access to return to the city sidewalks along Daniel and Penhallow. City staff and the owner also addressed parking concerns and the owner has agreed to add a provision to the current license request that would prohibit contractors and subcontractors from parking along Daniel and Penhallow for the duration of the project. That all being said, the draft license now reflects a request to erect pass-through staging above the sidewalks along Penhallow and Daniel for a period of time of 54 days to commence July 4th and wrap by August 26th or sooner if the work can be completed. Typically, um, when the public has access to a public sidewalk through this mechanism, license fees are typically waived. It's also important to note that the owner is requ required to request flagging permits outside the scope of this license if it is necessary to close Penhallow or a portion thereof for deliveries of construction materials which remain ongoing. The owner will be required to communicate uh, weekly and our legal and planning departments work together with the owner to craft this amend this license before you and uh, happy to stop there and entertain questions. So let's get a sample motion on, on the floor, uh, a look for a uh, motion to authorize uh, the city manager to finalize and execute the temporary construction license as presented, waiving the license fee due to the public public's access to sidewalks along Penn Hollow and Daniel Street due to the pass-through staging. So moved. Your second. Second. Any discussion? Councillor Cook, then Councillor Boyle. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the last time that McNabb Properties came before the council on this property, we were told it was the last request for an extension and that this would be completed. So I have lots of questions um, around the project, uh, parking, um, uh, the encumbrances on the sidewalk, um, and ways that communication um, with the neighbors can be improved. I also have questions around deliveries, the frequency of deliveries, deliveries how often they use flaggers, what the time of day that is that the flaggers come, um, and when we expect deliveries, if there's parking on site, for example, in the basement parking garage that should be completed at this point. Um, and I have a lot of these questions because I have witnessed on a few occasions um, a butters being told one thing and then that thing not happening. I've also witnessed trucks being parked in city parking spaces where our commercial, um, our regular commercial properties are anticipating people to park who are customers, um, not just in the spaces that are reserved um, currently for this project. So my question is, is, well, then will they just park in city parking spaces and pay the meters for four to six hours and then move the trucks again and take away parking from the neighbors um, who are anticipating a big business this summer because this is a very busy time of year for most of our our commercial properties and retailers downtown um, are they using the the underground parking garage when will those deliveries come um, will they be closing Penn Hollow, how frequently will they be closing Penn Hollow for those deliveries, thereby impacting the businesses on Penn Hollow Street? So I think it's worth having the city manager and maybe uh, deputy city manager or city attorney um, uh, weigh in on that. Do um, some clarification on, on just this. It says a license extension. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, city manager. Um, this is not an extension of the current license. That is correct. This is a um, pass-through, which requires a license because it's not an encumbrance fee. And the reason why it's not an encumbrance fee is because instead of a 30-day window, it's actually a 60-day window. So if it was 30 days, since this is an, this is this is we're getting the spots back, we're getting the sidewalks down. Uh, we are saying you can't park on on these streets. The extent they'll they'll meet the the deadline for the extension that they are currently working within, but we need to create staging for correct uh, the sidewalk. So that's fair. The word extension is a bit of a, a misnomer here. It's a new request. Uh, to your point, Mayor, anything beyond 30 days, which is something we can handle administratively, needs to come before council. So. That would explain why this request is new. It is for a length beyond 30 days, 
and is something of a different nature than the current license, which is set to expire July 3rd. The terms will change. And if it made sense at this time, I'm happy to bring on our chief building inspector, Shanti, who can speak to some of the, the, some of the challenges that um, he's addressed with developer, and he can, speak, he can speak specifically to the status of the uh, um, accessibility of the parking garage, which I think, I, I think it would be best to hear from Shanti. So Shanti, I see you on Zoom. I'm about to um, ask you, um, I'm actually gonna pr promote you to a panelist if you can join us at this time, if that's okay with you, Mayor. Good evening. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? We can. Mm -hmm. Good Good evening. Uh, yeah, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Councilors, City Manager. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, a specific question hasn't been asked of me, but I can um, give my perspective and, and I think specifically what the scope of this license extension um, will provide for McNabb team, um, as well as the city, as well as the residents, tourists, and businesses. So. Um, the scope of the license is um, very limited. It will not encumber the sidewalks with respect to not allowing members of the public to use the sidewalks because we walk past through staging. Um, all of the parking that has previously been encumbered will be returned to the city and the residents on Daniels as well as Penn Hollow. So that is a really big win. Um, the question about the underground parking and also the construction workers parking in the spots that will be returned to the city is that, and I have not read the, the language in the agreement, but McNabb team has stated and agreed that in fact, these spaces will not be for their workers. So along Penn Hollow and Daniels, um, these, these spaces will be um, specific to use for the residents um, and, and not the workers. So, and just to give a, a little, you know, an idea of the magnitude, um, and I know that all of you are aware of the magnitude, you've been living with it for the last three years. I've only been here for seven months. Um, there are 250 workers on average on that site daily, and there's approximately 55 parking spots, which they are being fully utilized. So, unfortunately, you know, there's still a little under 200 workers, not that they can't carpool and, you know, bus in, and I'm sure they do, but there's still a discrepancy, um, you know, left. So they are fully utilizing those the spaces down below, and I believe that they probably have been utilizing the spaces because they've paid for them, but now that they're going back to the city, that'll be done. So these spots legitimately will be going back to the city. Um, my, from what I, my experience with the McNabb team um, and Mark specifically has been that, you know, when there's a problem and we bring the problem to them, once again, I'm only speaking with my seventh month experience that they've been quick to hop on board. Um, sometimes, you know, it's difficult to find solutions and I understand that's not our problem. Ultimately, it's their problem, um, but they have been quick to work with us and, you know, and to listen to our ideas and to do, you know, basically, you know, whatever, whatever we've asked from what I've seen, they're willing to do. Now, that said, I know the promises get made uh, and they have been made. And then um, we will continue to get complaints um, because they need perhaps, you know, they need to remind their workers of the issues and the complaints that are coming in time and time again. You know, it's a, it's a really big project, but I think that the finish line is in sight, um, believe it or not. I mean, this is a really big win that by July 3rd, all the brick on Daniels and Penn Hollow will be down and the sidewalks, uh, excuse me, the parking spaces will be given back. So that is big. I mean, that's a milestone. Um, and then in the months to come exponentially, uh, you'll see big changes there. So, I mean, we could of course, deny and, and you know, and, and kind of slow this down and maybe they'd be forced to seek out alternative measures to complete the project. But <coughs> ultimately, right now, I think that they're looking for our support, for the support of the abutters um, so that we can get this done quickly, effectively, safely and to the finish line by, you know, ultimately by September. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of my my perspective on it. Um, feel free to 
to ask me any questions. Should you have any? Thanks, Shanti. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Shanti. Um, I've spoken to several of the abutting business owners, and many of them have expressed concern about coming before the council to share their trepida trepidation about the project and lack of communication um, because they're, they worry about retaliation, frankly. Um, so what can be done to actually improve communication, not with the owners of the neighboring buildings, but with the business owners that are in those buildings? Um, there are a lot of renters in that area as far as businesses go, so they don't necessarily own their properties and the, they're therefore not on the abutters list and are not necessarily re receiving direct communication? Uh, Councilor, is that a question to me? Yes. So, yeah, I was not aware that the tenants were not considered abutters and were not on that, on the email list, the weekly meetings and the email communications. Uh, I agree with you 100% that anyone affected by the property, you know, in the immediate area should be on that list and should be included in the communications so they can plan their their week their weekend their evenings and you know if they uh if there's something coming down the pike that would cause a disturbance during the day they should know about it um you know so i i think that that mcnab's team who should be responsible for that outreach uh and as city staff we can certainly follow up i mean we could we could you know take on that outreach but i do feel that um, that McNabb should really should do that and then provide us with all of the um, provide us with the list the names the, the units that are in fact now in the loop that weren't before because I wasn't aware of that um, and I have another follow-up question how how frequently do we have flaggers um, uh, delivering uh, established on Pin Hollow Street and deliveries coming for this project that require closure of that street? So I probably wouldn't be the one to ask about that. It may be, you know, uh, Peter from Public Works, but um, I'm guessing frequently and probably, you know, once a week. There are a lot of deliveries. It's a really big project. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would guess once a week, but, you know, uh, Mark McNabb or, or uh, Peter would probably be able to better answer that. I think we have the answer to that. I think it might be Peter or uh, Eric Eby. I asked that question this morning, um, and I found, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, um, that there was original request for uh, three days, full days, uh, worked with the city to get it to uh, three days, uh, ending at noon, uh, and there will be flaggers present uh, for that. Three days this week, and that request came in on Friday. Again, that's a separate request from the motion that's ahead of us right now. I think the conversation is a good one to have. And to your specific point, um, you know, I'm looking at really hoping this, you know, and I'm sure that everybody in Portsmouth, uh, McNabb, who's in the audience tonight, um, the uh, abutters, this council is looking forward to cutting a ribbon um, and having this, this project uh, completed. Um, what I would like to see, especially when I hear the, and I hear the communication, um, I would like to have um, an effort to understand this, um, and it could be a report back from uh, city manager or Shanti, but how can we, what have we learned from this communication? How can we improve the communication? Uh, again, this is, this was the city's kind of first, not rodeo, obviously with development, but the first being actively involved in the management of construction through a pandemic, which was, I think, a learning curve. We asked for and we received as part of this major upgrades um, in Penn Hall and Daniel that mm -hmm. added to the, uh, the immensity of this, this project. Uh, part of those upgrades were because, you know, if anybody's paying attention downtown, the electrical grid is not what it needs to be in order to support all those buildings. Um, but those uh, those will now benefit other buildings. But we have to get, I think, a, a better line of communication, and whether it's a counselor sitting on the abutters' emails to get a sense of what's going on here um, so that we can improve um, future ones, um, or if it's a recommendation um, on how we're going to do that. We got, you know, it's kitty corner to this project. I don't know if anybody's <laughs> heard about this building. Um, it goes by the McIntyre. 
Um, so <laughs> when we when we get into actually um, uh, you know constructing that, I'm hoping that what we've learned through this is going to better I influence what we're doing. I don't think the city is going to be in a position to turn around and, and go back to what it did before in terms of just, hey, these are, we're not going to have any involvement in this. I think Portsmouth's grown too much to have that. But I do think that we need, you know, there's a lot of lessons uh, here that, that were learned. Um, but in terms of, you know, what can we do uh, in the next, through this uh, agreement, um, and then going forward, um, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I think that the, and I should have passed the gavel, but I won't. Um, I, I, I think that <laughs> it's important to, uh, to recognize and, and to call out Shanti in terms of, uh, and the, you know, city staff, there was a, you know, a request to come back and say, hey, you know, we want to continue the way we're going. It probably would have been, uh, you know, I'm not going to speak for McNabb uh, or the, 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 the property, but continuing on the way that you're doing is probably less expensive than changing course. Um, but the, the city pushed back and said, hey, we want to figure out uh, a way to open these sidewalks and get the parking back. Um, and to the credit of the project, we did that. Um, the city was able to, to reach that agreement. Is this, you know, is this perfect in terms of the entire immensity of the project? No, it's not, because it's been a really long time. Uh, but I think given where we are right now, this is a better outcome uh, for the city and hopefully for the businesses. And I hope this is the beginning of, of, of a new phase of this construction that is, you know, we don't have to run any more under, underground conduit. I think the gas lines are, are in. Um, and I'm hopeful that this is the, uh, the turning of the page. But I don't want to, I, I would like to figure out whether it's a report back and we can have that emotion uh, later. Or having a report, uh, or having a counselor sit on the uh, the abutters email to glean what's the the type of um, the type of uh, communication going out and how we can better serve that. Those would be all years for that. Yeah. Councillor Bagley. Oh, sorry, Councillor Cook. Do you have in the same line of questioning? Yeah, I was just going to add. I was going to make a statement instead of asking a question. Sure. Um, uh, so my. My main concerns around this project are that we have a lot of retailers downtown that have suffered considerably the last few years because of the pandemic and construction has made that even more difficult. So I have real concerns about taking up a lot of the parking right around this project and even if the spaces are returned to the city, it benefits us frankly as a city to get the parking revenue from all from uh, the people working for um, McNabb properties who are parking there and paying the city fee all day. Um, that does benefit the city, but it doesn't benefit our retailers. And our retailers need a healthy turnover in the remaining parking spaces downtown to have a successful summer. So I think it's really critical that we find alternatives when we, when we have 250 or so employees um, on a project that need to park within that general area, whether it's transportation arrangements or um, and, and limitations on whether or not they can actually park on the city streets beyond the, um, the parking spaces that are paid for. Um, I'm, I'm also particularly concerned about this project keep being it, its extension. I remember very clearly when we last talked about it, this at the council level that it, the impression was given that the project, at least the outside of the project, would be completed by July 4th and that we wouldn't have to worry about sidewalk encumbrances, which also, believe it or not, even though you can walk under a scaffolding on the sidewalk does impact the local businesses. Um, I'm also particularly concerned um, about communication and making sure we get communication right for development, the city's only getting busier. And with more development, with more retail, with more businesses downtown, um, it becomes more and more difficult to, to build these projects. And I understand how hard that, it, that must be from a developer's perspective um, to build in a tight space. But as a result, we need to be thinking as a council about ways that we can make it easier on the downtown when we have a major project like this because it isn't the last one. So I just wanna make sure that we take the lessons learned 
from this project, that maybe we make some improvements now, like better transportation for workers so they're not parking on all of State Street and Daniel Street, taking up the limited space we have for the summer, and also ways that we can better enforce policies um, and, and enforce um, agreements that are made um, with the butters. So, Councilor Cook, I guess um, on the, the, the parking issue, um, are you proposing a, a specific, is there any proposal for uh, as a part of this agreement in terms of the parking? I think I just wanted the city manager to keep this in mind, that, that the people working on this project are not just parking in the spaces that were reserved for the project. They're also parking down Daniel Street on State Street. Um, in several other locations through town and taking up parking that could be used to rotate for retail space. Okay. Yeah. Councilor Bagley. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Um, yeah, this, this touches on one of my favorite topics, parking, and Councilor Cook is right. You know, turnover is vital to the, the downtown. So I'm very appreciative of city staff um, prohibiting parking along Daniel and Penn Hollow because they those two streets have kind of taken the – the brunt of this project. Um, but the fact is that the project was approved uh, long before most of us were on the council. We're nearing the finish line. Uh, the city's done a good job of, of making a structure that's going to get the project finished quickly um, with the least amount of pain. And, and of course it's painful. Um, I'm disappointed to hear that people feel they don't, uh, don't feel comfortable coming to these meetings to speak. Uh, you can always speak to us directly. Uh, most of us have email or other ways you can uh, contact us. Uh, I, I go down just about every morning for coffee, so walk by the project, see it, talk to some of the restaurants there, not, not as much to the retail. Um, what I've heard, and it did come up in the last parking tra traffic safety meeting, is that there's been somebody out there moving the contractors along. So, so you have to understand if there's 250 contractors, um, it's not 250 people working on the project. It's every week there's, there's concrete people and then there's electrical people and, and it, it's changing. So there's thousands of people working on this project. So you're constantly having to reinforce that message. You can't park here. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to hear that that message seems to be getting through, that we're doing a better job with it. Um, but I also think that, you know, something that's overlooked a little bit is projects like this are, are dangerous. You know, construction workers have one of the most dangerous jobs in America. And, and the safety record has been very good on this project. And you know, we, we have to balance the act of, of keeping the city vibrant, but we also can't handicap the developer so much that the project then becomes an unsafe workplace. So there's, there's a lot of competing uh, influences on this project. And, and I think we're striking a good balance. I think this particular agreement strikes an even better balance. Um, I think I can speak for everyone when I say that we all hope that the project finishes soon, but uh, I'm going to support it. Uh, there, there was a comment about the waiver of the license fee uh, that we did receive. It's, it's a relatively uh, small amount of money for a project of this size, but I, I would put out there that we want to incentivize people when they do projects to keep those sidewalks free. So we want to waive those fees because if we don't, we're taking away that incentive and people are just going to put up regular scaffolding instead of scaffolding that you can walk under. So there's, there's lots of ways to look at this. Um, I'm going to support it and hope that, you know, it's, it's the last one. And I've already gone on too much, but I'll, I'll say one last thing. I, in my regular job, I work in capital equipment. And the delays that we're experiencing with shipping, with, with products, with everything are, are just really out of control. I had a, a machine come into Long Beach, California from Germany, and it takes three or four weeks to get from Germany to Long Beach. And then it took eight weeks where it was just off the port, just sitting there. And every week the customer would call me and say, you know, when's my machine coming? And they'd say, well, the ship says it's not this week, it might be next week. And we did that for eight weeks in a row. And I would imagine in the construction and, and building trades, it's the same thing. It's very difficult to coordinate a delivery when you don't even know when your product's going to arrive. So it would be great if, if they could do all the deliveries at 7.30 in the morning on Wednesdays and Thursdays. But I don't think in today's environment especially that's a reasonable or maybe it's a reasonable ask, but I don't think it's a realistic ask because there's just so much going on right now 
in the logistical world that it, it, it's kind of a mess out there. So I think this is a good agreement. I hope it might be one of the last agreements like this that we have to do on this particular project, uh, but I'll be supporting it. Councilman Barty. Yeah. Um, this has been a long project, and it's, um, it's an amazing project. It's a very complex project. Um, I'm, I'm impressed that um, the developer has been able to keep the flow of, of supplies to complete this project in the time he's done. Um, I, I can't imagine that it, it could be done much in less time, or much less time than it has been. Um, yes, there have been extensions uh, for permits and things like that, but um, we do see the end to in sight and um, the, the developer has made great improvements to some of our infrastructure in the streets. Um, and that has, that has been a major disruption of, of the parking as well as the other things that have happened. Um, I just, I too hope that this is the last extension and um, I look forward to this building being open. I would, aside from that, I would also just as a technical thing, it looks like we have to actually vote to waive the license fee. It's a part of the motion. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. Anybody else? A few more um, comments, and I, along with Councillor Tabor, have been taking bites of this apple for uh, quite a while. Um, I think that looking back, some of the things that were uh, apparent to me now that were not apparent uh, was the uh, the amount of uh, upgrades that we were going to do as a city. Um, you know, looking back, I, I, that needs to be. Um, that needs to be more apparent um, for us to understand that. Um, again, the the uh, the pandemic is what it is. It was difficult, um, and uh, it's tough to um, it's tough to to plan for that. But I think understanding um, those even this year um, in Daniel Street, having a better understanding of of what um, we are asking a developer to do. But since we're asking that, I think we have a responsibility as a city to, to, to make that known, that these are things that are, that are coming up and should be weighted as a part of the entire project. Uh, state the asks of you know, electrification, putting the wires underground, you know, uh, the transformers, all of that um, should be a part of the discussion um, so that when we are granting original license extensions, we have a better, uh, we have a better sense uh, of that. And that's a... That's a that's a, a lesson learned. Um, uh, when uh, this was um, originally before us, uh, or when it, it comes to the city managers, it was originally a, an extension of the existing license agreement. And you know, I, I want to make sure. Uh, I guess two things. One, when it comes to the parking, um, we have it in the agreement that this is something that will be shared with the, the contractors. I'm sure that there will be a butters that if this is not, um, if this is not something, um, and I don't want to put it on the abutters to, to call. So if it's something that the city needs to uh, actively enforce, the city will actively enforce it. But the goal of this is to make sure that it's not, it's not on the the, the city uh, to actively enforce uh, these two. Uh, I mean, we'll actively enforce it, but I wouldn't like us to to be responding to, um, to to calls uh, all the time. But it is a big deal to, to change a project, to get the sidewalk back, even if it's under uh, the scaffolding. Um, it's a big deal to get the, the, the parking back. Um, you know, we had an option to rip up the bond and do the sidewalks ourselves. That would have delayed it, I think. Um, but we would have been uh, doing it. I don't think that was the best outcome. It might have been, you know, potentially the emotional feeling like we're, we're doing something, but at the end of the day, our job isn't to sit up here and react upon the emotion of what um, uh, feels the best. It always has to be what is the best. And I think that we got the best outcome out of this 
uh, for a project that will benefit the city, both the project that we won't see underground and the project that we will see, that part of the neighborhood. You know, I wish that construction was easier. I'm thankful every day I'm not a developer um, because it's, it's hard to, to, to manage that. Um, but it's, it's also hard, I think, for folks to feel as though um, they don't have a voice. So of all of the conversation up here, uh, that's the one that, that sticks with me, and I would look for a further motion to understand how can we improve the communication uh, of that. But I see a hand raised. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I, I did forget a uh, suggestion to Mr. McNabb and maybe the city manager is uh, because people are, you know, especially renters, may be hard to, to contact or get on an email list, uh, one idea might be to do a QR code on, on the fencing or, or something like that. If you want to learn more about this project or if you want to be on the email list, here's a QR code so you can easily sign up because um, that would be just one more avenue that we could maybe improve the communication a little bit. Okay, so I would put that into the second motion that I had weighed in terms of you know uh, either just a uh, communication improvements that we can make as a city around this project. But uh, further license extension, um, or rather, uh, a creation of a, uh, a uh, new license um, for uh, 60 days, uh, I will have a roll call vote uh, on this. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Cook? No. No. Mayor McCachran? Yes. Motion passes eight to one. Your Honor, can we take a quick break? Yes, I would just like to entertain a motion for a report back. So uh, moved. Communication. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, a five minute recess.
people still say weird. Two. All right. Uh, Thank you, Councillor Denton, for giving us the break. Although, uh, number seven, the Parsons with easements at 83 Pepperly Hill might not thank you as much. We got them before we go on to the uh, consent agenda. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, the last item under city manager's actions, uh, items which require action, is a request uh, to accept a, uh, easements related to the conditional use permit and site plan approval that was granted by the planning board for the open space plan unit use development at, Pever at 83 Peverly Hill Road. Mm -hmm. As part of that approval, the planning board recommended that the city accept 11 easements and a right of way. Tonight we are looking uh, to, the, uh, I should mention the planning board did approve all 11 easements and the right of way, but only 10 of the easements are presented for acceptance at this time. Easement I is not before the council as it goes hand in hand with the right of way. And as noted in the council packet, this request will return to council at such time as the right of way is constructed and approved for public use and ready for acceptance. So uh, staff attorney Trevor McCourt is here. He spent a considerable amount of time trying to make sure that these easements made sense uh, on, a, on a plan, if you will. I know the developer is present as well and happy to answer any questions you may have. Your Honor, I'd That's make a good. motion that we accept and record the city, we authorize the city manager to accept and record the 10 easement deeds and a declaration of restrictions in substantially simil similar form to the easement deeds from Parson Wood Investments, LLC, contained in the packet. So, second. Um, any uh, any, <laughs> any uh, other uh, questions or comments? Councilor Lombardi. Yeah, I just have a question. They have these paths. Um, do any of them connect to the rail trail? Yes. That was my question. <laughs> they do? <laughs> they do. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Would that be a question for uh, Mr. McCord here? Sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions, uh, Council Murrow? I, I really don't have any questions. I just uh, would like to state, as especially the uh, member of the planning board who's seen this from its inception and first ideas all the way through to the end, there's some really cool concepts that I think we've worked really hard to make sure that the public space is going to be properly signed and notified so that the public knows there are some trails because there's going to be about, uh, Trevor can correct me if I'm wrong, around 80 acres that are going to be in a city conservation land open to the public that basically takes you all the way back down to almost Banfield Road if I remember correctly. Um, so it's going to be a fair amount of, you know, open space land for the public to use. So I hope the public understands that they can go through this subdivision and there are public ways to get you all the way down on trails to that and to use the public spaces. So I'm just excited. That's all. I saw them break ground the other day. They're starting the road. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Trevor. Uh, yeah. All in favor? Late. Aye. Aye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. No, Thanks, Mayor. <laughs> All right, um, so we've gotten through the uh, city manager's items which uh, require action. Uh, next up is the consent agenda. Do we have folks that are still on Zoom? You said from. We have, Let's go um, through the. Uh, uh, I'll wait a motion to adopt the consent agenda. So moved, Your Honor. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, and then we've done the. Um, uh, sample uh, and then email correspondence. Uh, a sample motion would be uh, moved to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, we've taken uh, item B up. Uh, item C, um, a paper street. Um, now we've already we've already done half of this paper street uh, on the Dennett side, so it's not likely going anywhere. Um, so sample motion to be uh, moved to refer to the planning board for report back to city council. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, and then letter from attorney uh, Sherilyn Burnett Young regarding the application for urbanized Sherilyn exemption uh, for Salter Street, which you already did. Yeah, oh, we did. we did that, right? We did it. Yes. yes. Awesome. Did. Okay. So uh, next up is uh, I will uh, 
since I see some folks in uh, the audience and I asked them, uh, they were here for uh, Councillor Moreau. So I am going to look to suspend the rules to bring uh, Council Moreau's items uh, up ahead. So moved. moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Council Moreau, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, I uh, have been having several conversations um, throughout our community with multiple um, not-for-profits and possible uses of the Lister Academy. I know it hasn't been actually voted on yet, but um, it certainly seems after talking to uh, you know some people at, at the school level that, that they all seem to be in favor of trying to move the Lister Academy out to the community campus, which then frees up a building that um, is in grave need of repairs, and we know in about the tune of $10 million, uh, of which I know us as a city, at least me as a city councilor, doesn't want to spend that money uh, to do it. So I'd certainly rather uh, that we work to find what the best use of the property might be. Therefore, um, I've made, I'd, my motion is to move for a report back from the city manager consisting of an initial estimate on the amount to date that the city of Portsmouth has spent, oh, God, I'm reading the wrong one. This ha I gotta put my glasses yeah, back on. Yeah, that was Councilor Tent. I know, I'm like reading the wrong one, I'm reading sorry. reading the wrong one too, and I was like, okay, yeah, this is, this doesn't sound what well, I expected Well, because they start with sound. the same line. Yeah, yeah, all So right. sorry, strike that, let me start over. Now yeah. my glasses are on. Uh, move to request that the city manager investigate obtaining an engineer to do feasibility study on possible future uses of the current Lister Academy property, which is owned by the city located at 35 Sherbourne Road in preparations for supporting our 2022-23 goals of the City Council. And if there would be possible ARPA funds available to complete this work, in other words, to cover the costs of the work. So that is my motion if I get a second. Second. And, you know, just to finish my discussion, because I kind of went into a ramp, ramp, rampage before I actually gave you my motion, but I, I just think that there could be great partnerships of nonprofit possibilities at this facility after having many conversations on it. And therefore, I'd like to really know, you know, how much land is there, how feasible it is, how much could we build on, you know, is there bad soil, you know, all those engineering type things, just a true feasibility of what's out there, what's usable, what's buildable, and uh, a report back to us I think would really help us once we are ready to really take a look at what should happen at that property. That's all. Thank you, Councilor Moe. Councilor Dunn. <clears throat> Thank you, Honor. This is only tangentially related, but you mentioned the community mm -hmm. campus, and uh, some residents have reached out to me simply asking if there was a committee formed for the community campus that it be posted for everyone to join. So the answer, uh, uh, committee uh, for what on the community campus? Just a community campus like overview of that, like a Correct. Pierce Island type thing? What's going to be done with the property? Um, so I haven't, and this could come up through the governance committee, um, I haven't um, uh, decided to form a Blue Ribbon Committee. Uh, we can obviously change that decision as a council. What I've looked at community campus as being um, a in the, I guess, collection of properties that as other projects come forth, community campus is now a home to those potential projects. Instead of trying to figure out what the grand master plan for community campus would be, I've decided, at least in my limited power as mayor, that we would um, we would use that more as a, a place to put priorities that we have instead of trying to figure out priorities for uh, a building to try to think of it as a city landscape or a city uh, uh, in the city scale. But I'm happy if a councilor wants to bring forth the desire to build a or create a, uh, a Blue Ribbon Committee around that. Um, we could support that, but uh, would want that to, to come. So far, I've not decided to, to, to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> councilor Bagley. Yeah, I just want to compliment Councilor Moreau on bringing this forward. Um, it may feel like it's hasty because we haven't officially decided that the Lister Academy is going to move, but at the same time, it, there's no harm in investigating parallel tracks for efficiency. Mm -hmm. You know, I, Council Morrell, I'm, I'm super excited that you brought this forward. I, I, I was 
quoted in the paper saying something about icebergs um, and community <laughs> campus being an iceberg. You know, potentially that's the wrong thing to say uh, about any investment that we have um, in relation to what icebergs do. But when they do break apart, they start moving uh, in a lot of different ways. And I think this is one of those ways that um, the Purchase Community Campus could open an opportunity for us, um, especially with land. And we should know as much as we can about the land that we own and what we could do uh, with that land, it's a great idea. And if ARPA funds could be applied, that would be something that I think would be a, a good use uh, of that. So very much in favor of this. So with that, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Do I continue? Give us the update. Got all the right. Floor. Yes. I am going to give you a, um, I put in for a verbal update on the Portsmouth Hampshire 400. For those of you that don't know, I am actually the team leader for our signature events for next year. Um, so you may be hearing a lot from me over the course of the next year because <laughs> we're getting closer and closer. Uh, but we have three signature events. And on Saturday, June 3rd, there will indeed be a parade. It should be a lovely parade that is being worked out through some very familiar names right now. And they are... Um, going to put something together. They're working in conjunction because Riverfest will be going on at the same time. So it's going to be a really big celebration kind of weekend. So don't plan any vacations. On Monday, August 28th, we are combining forces with the chamber to do what they would normally do. Those of you who don't know, they do an annual um, community kind of dinner or networking event they typically call Street Life. So we are partnering with them to do a community dinner and just to sort of tease it out a little bit, imagine everyone sitting down to dinner from Market Square all the way down Congress Street. You know, something small and intimate of, you know, 700 of your closest friends. So it ought to be, there'll be a lot of things around that as well. But more importantly, there will be a um, press release going out tomorrow. There's been some very uh, wonderful, articulate people working way smarter than me, working on a press release that's going to tell you that we are officially uh, publicly announcing today that we are going to have on Saturday and Sunday, September 9th and 10th, we are going to have another Thunder over New Hampshire. We're calling it Heritage in the Air, Air Show and Open House. We are working in connection with the Air National Guard with that. Um, <clears throat> Portsmouth, New Hampshire 400 will actually be um, putting together the entire welcome event for that, which will be held on Friday evening of September 8th. That should be like 500 of your closest friends, and it's only like a week and a half after the dinner, so this ought to be really easy to pull off. Uh, once again, I have a lot of people much smarter than me working on all this, just trying to keep me involved. Uh, so those are the three really big signature events that are going to market, but just to give you an idea, I will run through some of the other events that are going to be going on. We have special projects, um, Course of New Hampshire History in 101 Objects. It's a book featuring 101 objects and essays of 80 different authors. Uh, Site-specific theater productions at three different locations. We're going to have Course of New Hampshire 400 commemorative book, which is stories of residents and events over the past 50 years. Uh, 50 years, 400 years of history, comic book intended for middle schoolers. And then we also have Portsmouth High School students working on an oral history project. And they're actually going out and trying to videotape um, people talking that have been around for, you know, as long, a lot longer than I have. Believe it or not, there are people older than me. Uh, we are going to have special events starting Sunday, December 31st uh, and January 1st. First night, Portsmouth 2023 will be the start and end of our year of celebration. Uh, Sunday through Tuesday, May 7th through 9th, Keeping History Above Water, Portsmouth, 20, 20, uh, Portsmouth 2023 National Symposium on Sea Level Rise. It's an actual national symposium that's coming specifically to Portsmouth to do it for our 400th. So I would like to thank our lovely Stephanie Secord, who has been in charge in getting that going. Um, we have History Through Art Mural on May 21st. We have June 15th through 19th, Black Heritage Trails doing music and education. June 25th, Vintage Baseball. August 5th, Moffat Ladhouse, William Whipple Day with costume role players. September 23rd, 24th, Portsmouth Maritime Festival. Saturday, October 7th, The Westable, Community Fun and Games. Uh, Tuesday, the 31st of um, October is going to be the Halloween parade, which will be everything's going to be like normally incorporated with the Portsmouth 400. 
Uh, there's several weekends at Strawberry Bank with the 400 years of winter celebrations for the stroll. And then the first night, um, we are also have some fundraisers going on. So the Seacoast Half Marathon this coming October 2022 will benefit, be all to benefit and raise money for the Portion 400. Uh, and there's also going to be July 29th of 2023, Little Italy Carnival Masquerade Ball Fundraiser will be taking place to raise money for some of those. So we have a lot of really fun things, and this is just a sampling. Believe it or not, there actually are more <laughs> things that people are working on that come to us. They're working on a master calendar, and we're going to be hopefully rolling that out in the next week or two. I don't want to speak about on that one because I know the calendar's been hard to get functioning. but. Hopefully that just gives you an idea of all the excitement around our birthday coming up next year. Right. You ready to party? And all people, year. And we've still got to get all this work done that we do every time. If, if people want to help, um, yes. is there a way that they can reach out and be involved in the planning or volunteering? Or Absolutely. Organizing? We are going to easily need 500 volunteers a day just for the air show alone, not to mention many other things. but. Um, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, 400.org. Yes. I got a, I got a nod. I was having to remember that off the top of my head. That is the website, and I believe there are links there for you to reach out and volunteer and help and to email uh, the group. So that's great. Please Thank come you. help. Council Marone, <laughs> sounds fun. All right. I'm done. Now Not I will. Uh, so go back. Uh, to me, these are. Um, Appointments under my name. Um, so this is a blue ribbon committee. So uh, they don't actually require a vote um, But uh, they as I understand that but if there are uh, Concerns one requires a vote. what's that? I think we have one that requires we do have one uh, the HDC But the appointments I will read them out Andrea Ardito Will Arvello Kathy Beebe Abby Frank uh, Janet uh, Latesh uh, Tania Marino, Lori McIntosh, uh, Lori Waltz, uh, Mimi Wheeler, uh, Molly Wilson, uh, Whitney Brown, uh, Amber Buttermore, and then Linda Briolet, uh, who you've received the applications here. I understand that there is one more that has an application that uh, we'll, I will uh, have at the July. We will have them um, join. But, uh, Councillor Cook? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to once again just commend Councillor Bagley on this idea for a COVID response task force <coughs> Blue Ribbon Committee and note that the individuals that have applied to be on this committee are what I would consider the rock stars of the service nonprofit industry in the area. So we would be very fortunate to have any of these individuals serve on this committee and thank you to whomever um, took part in some recruitment process to encourage them all to apply. Yeah, that was all Councillor Bagley, and uh, kudos to, to him getting <clears throat> folks, uh, or at least as I understand it, uh, I, I didn't have to twist any arms uh, for <laughs> any of this. He was, he was plenty twisty uh, already, and it does speak to the, the, the foresight of Councillor Bagley. I think it also speaks to the members of the community that would like to step up uh, and serve, and I think that our responsibility to them is to make sure that they have the ability to do so. I think we've already segmented out, uh, I think it was $50,000 for a need study uh, around that. 65,000. Um, 65,000. 65,000 yep. in terms of the need study. So it would be one of the, potentially one of the first things that they could be involved with is is helping coordinate uh, that. But I will, uh, I won't uh, get in front of the group uh, uh, just yet, but thanks again, uh, Councilor Bagley, for and you're welcome and for everybody that, that signed up. Uh, next, we do have to vote uh, appointment for reappointment of Martin Ryan to the HDC. A sample motion moved to reappoint Martin Ryan to the Historic District Commission. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Councilor Denton. Thank you, Your Honor. I move for a report back from the city manager consisting of an initial estimate on the amount to date that the City of Portsmouth has spent and is currently planning to spend on infrastructure to mitigate the impacts of anthropogenic climate change to include but not limited to improvements to our wastewater treatment plants, sewers, and seawalls. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, Count Dunn. Good to know that. Uh, we've done Councilor Murrow, both of those. Um, Councilor Bagley. 
Uh, yes, thank you, Your Honor. In your uh, packet, there is the Parking Traffic Safety Committee Action Sheet Minutes of June 2nd, 2022. And I move to accept and approve the action seat and minutes of June 2nd, 2022 Parking and Traffic Safety Committee meeting. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Councilor Blaylock. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I would just like to move to refer to the city manager uh, to report back regarding the reestablishment of Student Government Day. If I get a second, I'll. Second. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> too loud. <laughs> Thank you, sister. <laughs> appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> um, I had the pleasure of participating in Student Government Day as a PHS student uh, growing up, uh, my junior and senior year. I believe I was the city prosecutor my junior year, and I was the assistant mayor my senior year. Um, but I want to thank Mary Carey Foley, um, longtime PHS English teacher. She was the one that always organized this in the past. She was the one that always kept it going. Um, she has since retired from Portsmouth High School. She's still around, and we love to see her smiling face around town. But I would like to uh, see if we can get this going again. Um, I think it's really important to engage the youth, uh, especially the high school students. Um, I think it's important for they learn by participation. Um, and I think uh, having a memorable experience that they can learn from and build on and potentially even run for city council someday. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. I can't uh, wait to, to give up the gig of being mayor. Uh, yeah, we, we all, all those lacrosse kids and the <laughs> yeah. track team, you know, they're all going yeah, we'll to get yeah. one. Them on the are smarter uh, in this seat than me, so look forward to that. Uh, any, cool. any discussion on this? Great idea, Councilor Blaylock. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Um, we have the approvals of grants and donations. Um, this is a uh, first one, acceptance of donation from uh, John uh, Chagnon to the cemeteries. Uh, first, a motion to, to change to add purpose and, and use of the donation. Mm -hmm. Second. Do we have a, 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 we need to move to do that. Uh, so you seconded it, but we, uh, I had weighed a motion to change to add purpose and use of the donation. Parliamentary inquiry. Can we accept all of them as one motion with the exception of the bench, which we've already accepted? Or do we feel the need to go through these one by one? Well, I think that um, in terms of going through them uh, one by one, um, you know, I would like to call out the folks that uh, have, uh, you know, have donated. Um, you know, there's some that are uh, more modest than others, but I would, I would like to be able to call out individuals. I do believe there is a, uh, from a skate park fundraiser, is a uh, move to accept and approve the donations, um, uh, various donations. I don't think we have individuals there, but. I'm okay with. Okay, and that, I will make a motion for the acceptance of donation from John Jagnan to the Cemeteries Committee of fifteen hundred dollars. Second. Okay. Um, so I guess I just I have on mine uh, the the uh, mm. the agenda that we have a motion to change to add purpose and use of donation. So so, so that contribution attorney? is for uh, the historic cemeteries. Okay. So he intended that to be designated for historic cemeteries. Okay. So um, so to the cemeteries, meaning uh, we would have to. Okay. So move to approve and accept the donation. Uh, for the use of historic cemeteries. Correct. Okay. So uh, if I get a second to that Second. Motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next up, an acceptance of donation from Barbara uh, Melindry to the Portsmouth 400 of the total of uh, $100. So moved. Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, next up is the... Uh, Acceptance of donation for uh, Johanna Jackson to the skateboard park of $51.50. Sample motion moved to approve and accept the donation as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And 
acceptance of community, and this one's a little bigger, um, acceptance <laughs> of community development block grant funds of $523,706. Sample motion moved to authorize the city manager to apply for and accept and expend the community development block grant in the amount of $523,706 through the, through, uh, oh, I found a typo. Uh, through the U.S. Department uh, of Housing and Urban Development. From uh, the U.S., uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And then um, the acceptance of various donations from the Skate Park fundraiser. Sample motion moved to accept and approve the donations as presented. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So I guess that Councilor Bagley is on this. Um, I, I, I would love to have a maybe a, uh, a better policy around uh, donations above a certain amount um, are listed individually and then donations for a specific cause that we have on the website where there's multiple donations coming through um, can be brought forth to the council um, on a, uh, a, a monthly or instead of every meeting um, for a, a more collection or, or uh, consent agenda almost. Yeah, so if we could, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd look forward to a counselor in, in a future uh, meeting figuring out a, a path to to take on uh, and working with staff so long as there's not RSAs that prohibit us from uh, accepting donations in bulk but you know people uh, might not want uh, that there's always a record but they might not want you know uh, a, a publicly acknowledged Suzanne do you have any I'm just saying there is no statutory requirement that says you have to accept these donations it has just been City of Portsmouth practice. Okay, but given now, I think that we do have online uh, ability to raise uh, money. Um, we might have a um, a check. Do we want to be publicly acknowledged or, or not? And I don't know. Let's let's have a let's somebody think of a a good motion to put together uh, for a future meeting if uh, a better way to to handle this, um, or if there's no change necessary. On a chair. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, in the past, we talked about some of the donations that were made also in having a more consistent policy um, across staff. So um, say when we receive donations for the police or with for the fire department that we know what those donations are designated for. Um, so I think this is something that is reasonable for the governance committee to work with the staff to develop a policy around since we don't have a clear policy. Perfect. I know that was the takeaway. So why don't we add the uh, to Councilor Bagley's point on uh, whether or not uh, we can uh, bunch these donations again, <coughs> the pluses and minuses to that, and, and bring it back to the council. Fantastic. All right. Uh, the city manager has a few informational items, so I will pass it uh, back to her. Thank you, Mayor. Items one and two are similar in that. We have shared this this information with the council. We have shared this information on the city website, and we just wanted to, in the in the um, idea of full transparency, provide it in a council packet. Uh, the first is an update on the Sagamore Avenue sewer extension project, and um, the takeaway here is that city staff are anticipating responses from those property owners interested in participating on or before July 15th, so I would anticipate an update on the interest level at the August 1st City Council meeting. The second is a report back on the PFAS sampling of the new athletic field. Uh, the memo is in the packet. The memo was shared previously. The memo is on our website. Happy to answer any questions we have staff here tonight. Um, I'll move ahead to number three, which is uh, the status of the Penway Manor and the Maple Haven sidewalks. As alluded to earlier, I, I believe it was the Assistant Mayor who may have mentioned, uh, in advance of replacing sidewalks, we've solicited lots of input from residents um, in both the um, how do you feel about sidewalks camp and then how do you feel about trees and greenery um, with the potential loss of street trees. And due to um, wanting to take additional, uh, to accept additional input and solicit additional feedback, and because of the lack of clear consensus from both neighborhoods, it has been the decision of staff um, with my support, obviously, to hold off on construction this season to allow for that additional public input. It's really um, 
It's, it, the, the issues are different by neighborhood, and they are, they are not simply solved. So we want to continue the conversations. We will schedule additional public meetings with each neighborhood to gauge support for bidding sidewalk work this fall with anticipated construction if it were to happen in the spring of 23. Number four is an update on the status of the police station facility. And uh, Public Works, in conjunction with the police department, has prepared a request for qualifications to conduct the enabling engineering and design work for the new police um, facility, whether it be new or renovated. The timing is such that the, uh, the RFQ would be advertised July 1st. We would accept submittals by the end of July, and we would ex immediately after that create a short list and proceed with the request for proposals and we will keep the council updated on progress as we achieve milestones in that regard. Uh, I'll pause there if there are any questions on item one through four before I go into number five. Councilor Denton, and then I, I saw the court of, okay, we'll just start with Councilor Denton and then I'll, <clears throat> Thank you, Honor. I'll work through everybody's first. This question. is in regards to the report back on PFAS sampling. Um, if we did want to discuss uh, taking action should that be done in non-public? Um, it depends which action you would like to take. Um, so if you are asking with regard to whether some action against the manufacturers or the installers, then we certainly could um, have a conversation in non-public, um, you know, if you're considering litigation. What we have said previously is that the um, contractor and the suppliers did meet specifications. They met the contractual specifications. There was a standard uh, in our bid documents in terms of what was required, and they met that standard. So we've said that before, but if you want to go in any further direction and with regard to that, um, then we should do that in, in non-public. Thank you. Councilor Cook. I have two questions related to two different items here. Um, the first on PFAS, um, can we get a report back on the new EPA standards and how the results of this report would fit within the new P EPA standards? So let me uh, suggest we do still, I believe, have on Zoom the uh, two experts who produced this report. And because that is that question came up, obviously, from staff, um, and uh, we did actually review these results with the, the technical experts that we have uh, with Ms. Amico um, at her request. Uh, so we did try to uh, share information and they are available and could perhaps uh, pretty quickly, I think, explain where, where this sits and, and what's the same and what's different. So They're it's still on. Yeah. God, God love them, 1015, all right. Uh -huh. Karen as well. Yep, Karen. Yep. Yeah. I can ask my, yeah. if you want me to ask my Once second I, question and then while we're, oh, well, they're here, never mind. I think they're coming on pretty quickly here. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Karen, do you want to start off? Do you want to? Do you want to introduce yourself, um, Elizabeth, maybe? Oh, sure, sure. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Denley with TRC, and I am uh, TRC's uh, PFAS initiative leader and chemistry director. Um, I've been with TRC a little over 22 years. I am a chemist, um, and I've been working a lot on PFAS um, issues over the last five or six years. And who else do we have on Zoom? And Karen, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, um, good evening. So my name is Dr. Karen Vitrano. I am a PhD level toxicologist with TRC. Um, I've been with them for 32 years. Um, I've been working with Liz on PFAS issues. I also have experience with artificial turf fields, primarily be from rubber fields. I've done white papers for um, New York City's Department of Health on um, you know, health and toxicity of the crumb rubber fields. So. Uh, sure. uh, Councilor Cook, would you mind restating your question uh, for uh, Dr. Vetrano uh, and uh, Ms. Tenley? I asked 
how do how do the results of our testing compare to the new EPA standards around PFAS? Um, apples and oranges. Um, so the new health advisories are for drinking water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are um, turf fields. So, you know, we're, there's going to be very limited types of exposure. It's only dermal type of um, exposure um, to anybody, you know, participating in sports on these fields. Um, in terms of the chemical analysis that we did, we in the untreated samples, and so, you know, if you, Liz can talk to the analysis that we did, but essentially um, they did an analysis on the untreated um, turf fields, the various components, and then we uh, there was a post-treatment sample. So they, um, that was the top assay, they subjected it to a highly oxidizing um, environment. And so what that was supposed to do was if there were any precursor chemicals um, in the um, turf components, that it would force them into um, other types of PFAS compounds. Um, what we saw was a very, very limited um, uh, results in terms of what was uh, positively identified. Um, those that were, were very low concentrations. Um, PFAS only showed up in that post-treatment sample of the carpet. And so the carpet is considered the, the green filaments. Um, again, very low concentrations. Um, if we look at what the, the promulgated um, toxicity values, EPA toxicity values, um, we were uh, about 714 times lower than what um, EPA would be considered safe for a residential environment. Um, these interim value, these interim um, health advisories, um, again, they're interim values. Um, they may be subject to change. Um, you know, the EPA's old science advisory board has some criticisms of these reports and um, the values that they've chosen. So EPA is going to have to address those. But nonetheless, if um, while we were on the call and waiting, I was kind of doing some back of the envelope calculations. And um, if you took the um, what's called the reference dose, it's a dose that EPA considers that somebody can be exposed to for a lifetime without having any health effects. Um, if you took the RFD that the new health advisory was based on, um, the um, detected concentration in the carpet, again, that's just the post-treatment. This is like the worst case scenario. Um, it's actually worst case than what would be seen in a natural environment. We were like um, approximately three times higher than what would be considered safe for a residential environment. Um, but the thing that you need to understand is with these RSLs, these are, it's primarily exposure to soil and it's primarily based on ingestion of soil. So, you know, the pathways don't really line up. So it's a very conservative estimate. Um, the EPA has a, like a calculator. So I just kind of plugged in, okay, if somebody was going to be on these fields three hours a day, five days a week, what would the number be? And again, um, and then I used the new reference dose that these new health advisories on. And we were about using that type of scenario, we were about 1800 times lower than what would be considered a safe level. So these are really tiny, tiny amounts that we saw. Um, again, we only saw it when we forced it um, using a um, highly oxidative um, environment, uh, you know, during this assay. Um, and we wouldn't expect to see them in the natural environment, you know, in the, um, yeah, in under natural conditions. Um, everything else that we saw, they're very, again, very low concentrations. They're well below any of the uh, promulgated uh, either federal or state standards. And um, again, the comparisons that I was making was 
um, comparing them to residential soil samples, um, which is highly um, health protective because you're not going to get that type of exposure off of these turf fields. I think it's important to note too, you know, the health sorry, advisories. Sorry, I just just before we go, um, and I and I want to hear that, uh, Ms. Denley, but uh, we're talking about oxidizing as if we're a bunch of chemists up here, and I can, you know, um, you know I'm thinking of like oxyclean. I'm thinking, you know, bleach. I'm thinking, uh, but I would like to. Can we, I guess, better define for an oxidizing chemical? You said it's worse than the worst case uh, scenario. Would you mind just? Explaining like we're five, uh, and, and you know, my yes. high school chemistry is is long in the past. If we could go through what an oxidizing chemical is, why it would potentially be used, and then um, what the uh, the real life scenario um, that that it might compare to uh, would be would be very helpful, I think, to the conversation. Sure. So I think there's just a little bit of confusion. So the samples were analyzed. The three different samples of the synthetic turf were analyzed as is. So the manufacturer sent samples of this material to the lab and they were analyzed as is. But the lab also took a separate portion of each sample and they did an oxidation of it. Okay, it's called a total oxidizable precursor analysis, but I'm not going to get into all that. But they took the sample, they oxidized it with, with chemicals, with potassium persulfate and sodium hydroxide, and they heated it up. And the point of that, of doing that oxidation, was to see if there's anything else in those materials that could, any other PFAS chemicals in those materials that could be, could transform in the future. Um, and they're not, you know, because a typical PFAS analysis can only measure so many PFAS compounds. There's, you know, over 12,000 PFAS chemicals out there, right? So it, this analysis will determine if there's anything else in that sample that could transform because, and it will break down because of that oxidation. And so we're trying to, when we look at the result of the um, sample after oxidation, we might expect to see some increases in some of the PFAS. And this is worst case scenario. In the environment, these samples are not going to be oxidized that strongly, but they could be transformed somewhat. And this is just worst case what would happen to those samples. But I do want to point out that the health advisories, these really low health advisories were for PFOA and PFOS. And we did not detect PFOA and PFOS in any of the samples before they were oxidized. So they, these two chemicals were not present in these samples. Um, and even the new health advisories, you know, EPA acknowledges that every PFAS chemical behaves differently. I mean, they came out with health advisories for two other PFAS chemicals, one of which was 500,000 times higher. So uh, right now, I don't, the health advisories don't play into this, as Karen said, because those are really for um, ingesting drinking water, and we're talking about here dermal exposure um to these to these chemicals potentially i don't know if that helped a little bit um with the explanation of the um it did and i had one question reading through the um the actual info or the the executive summary um when you tested the first um can you explain how you went about uh testing those samples uh, i believe i understood it as it was they were being um uh, uh, ground or uh, created into a, a powder-like substance? Is that is that Right. Accurate? Right. So each sample you can see was, you know, kind of made up of different um, materials. So we wanted, we wanted to take, we took each sample and we wanted to get a representative sample, right, of this, of this matrix, which is a little unique. So we had the lab, um, they used this cryo mill procedure, which kind of just homogenizes that whole sample into like, it becomes like a powdery substance. So at the end, we're, we know we're getting, um, you know, we're, we're getting the PFAS out of the entire sample. It's a representative sample because we're homogenizing it. We're not just cutting off a small portion, you know, and maybe we're getting a little bit of that grass piece and not enough of the the backing, you know, so it was just all homogenized together um, to make sure that we were, again, representative. Um, and then um, one last question, I'll, I'm sure others, and I've just taken, uh, I didn't pass the gavel with any of this, but the, um, how was the PFAS in the, we had, we had decided as a city to not go forward with the um, crumb rubber and instead use walnut 
in infill um, instead. Can you speak to how the PFAS, which I understand to be a, uh, a non-organic non uh, component, uh, made its way into what I believe to be organic components in terms of walnut uh, infill? So you're asking, yeah, so, I mean, we don't know. I mean, we'd have to talk to the manufacturer, but, you know, one way is that, you know, whether the um, PFAS was in the environment and the, the walnut trees, um, there was uptake into the plant material and then it, you know, and it was incorporated into the walnut shells, um, you know, that's one of the ways that, um, you know, it gets into foodstuffs, whether the fields are, you know, um, you know, agricultural fields with bio, you know, fertilized with biosolids that have PFAS, PFAS can be uptaken for plant material. So, or whether there was, you know, deposition, if it was airborne and it was deposited into the soil or onto the leaves of the tree and then up to, you know, brought up into the plant material itself. So it, there could have just been environmental exposure from where the uh, walnut trees were being harvested. Okay. Uh, Council Morell and Councilor Tabor. Is there any um, concern that we should have in the long term that the what you have found existing even in small quantities could ever break down and contaminate soil or water supplies anywhere in the vicinity of the fields? So I'll just start and then I think Karen can finish, but because we did that oxidation on these samples, that's worst case of how these samples could potentially break down or transform in the environment over the long term. And when we did do that procedure, that oxidation, we really still only saw extremely low levels of a couple of different uh, PFAS chemicals. So Karen, I don't know if you want to uh, just expand on that from a toxicity. Yeah, so, you know, again, as, you know, summarized in that report that we did that conservative screening and, you know, looked at, um, you know, these risk numbers and everything was well below. There was, you know, there were a couple, I think it was the um, PPF acid. You know, that one, there was a higher concentration of that. Um, but again, that's a very short chain um, PFAS compound, I think it's only, you know, three carbons. So it yeah. won't bioaccumulate, um, you know, the, the shorter um, chain PFAS compounds um, don't bioaccumulate such as the long ones like the, P, the PFOS and PFOA, uh, they're, and therefore they're not as toxic um, to humans as well as, you know, ecologically. So. Um, you know, I think, again, the concentrations were so low, and for the most part, um, if you take some time again and look, re-look at this report, if you look at the table one, you'll see a column where there's U U's and J's. And so the J's are, they were detected, but they were detected below a detection limit. So they were, they're, it's actually an estimated concentration. They knew it was there, but it was below really, the detection limit of the um, the instrument that they were using, so it was an estimated constant concentration. Right. So those are are not accurate values. No. Um, you know, so again, we believe you know that yes, they're there, but they're pretty much they're there as trace concentrations. Councilor Bagley, um, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just I guess a. Uh, non-scientific question for both of you because a lot of this is a bit over my head um if these fields were in your neighborhood um would you have any concerns with them playing on them yourselves or by your family members yeah. and I, I and i go i've done from rubber and i would have no problem playing on these as well thank you Councilor Bella. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'd just like to state that the, the two lacrosse teams are in here today, both won their championships on the on turf fields. Uh, they practice on turf fields, they play on turf fields, and they play away games. Um, this Sunday, I also hosted a football clinic on the new turf field for third to eighth graders. Um, in your professional opinion, do you think there is any risk um, 
doing such an event. Yeah. I honestly, if you, if the hot more, there'd be more risk to uh, like a soccer, somebody wearing shorts to getting a raspberry from sliding on the field than, you know, having exposure to a toxic exposure to PFAS. Thank you. Councilor Tabor. Um, thinking back to the December motion, I, we wanted to, in the motion we asked to compare to the soil uh, around the field to get a baseline. Um, was that in the report? Is that what the discussion here is of residential level screening? Um, um, we didn't have soil data. We only, what we did was compared the actual concentrations in the turf components to um, the soil uh, numbers that have been put out by the gov federal government as well as um, the state. So, you know, the state has the um, 0.1 uh, value for like PFAS. And so that's what we were comparing. You know, we were comparing that comparing the concentrations in the turf materials to the soil concentrations, um, the soil limits set up by um, the state and the government, federal government. Yeah, right. we didn't analyze any soil samples. Okay, thank you. If you'd like, I could answer that just a little further. While there was discussion at that city council meeting, the actual vote did not call for taking the soil samples, which is why we did not do so. And of course, the challenge with any soil sample, particularly out there, is where would you take it from to be representative? Um, because it is a fairly large site. So um, you could have a cleaner spot or a less clean spot because it's so uh, common in the environment. And so. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm, I thought that was a friendly amendment, but I guess that uh, I'll have to go back and look at the minutes. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Vetrano and uh, Ms. Denley uh, for sticking on uh, as long as you did and uh, for answering the questions uh, and for the report. Sure. And, you know, if the council has any further questions, you know, uh, it can be forwarded to us and we'd be happy to answer any other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mayor. I actually have a second question, but I think before that, I have to make a motion to extend the meeting oh, beyond 1030. Right. You do. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is it for, uh, was it on PFAS? No, it is not. Oh, okay. Um, uh, the question is for the city manager around the RFQ process for the um, design of a police station. Um, I know when this was discussed initially, I had requested a report back on a need study. Are we still in that phase where we're doing need study before we get to design, or how is this process proceeding? We are we are taking a, a look at the the needs assessment to update that that dated assessment, if you will, as part of the request for quals and moving into the request for proposals. Okay, so. A follow-up there so will we receive the results of the needs assessment before we actually have the request for pr pr proposals I'm asking this because I'm I'm curious about this process um, noting that we'd we'd need to know need before we ask for a particular architectural design if, if I may can we ask to hear from Peter do you want to take that Peter the quals statement is intended to identify eligible or, or likely firms that would be willing to, to do an RFP, a request for a proposal a response. The intent is to get a firm on board that is able to do the entire process, which will help lead us through the public process, which is the needs assessment, mm -hmm. as well as the programmatic uh, assessment, as, and then lead us into site selection and the architectural aspects of it. 
So really, it's, it's really just to get the ball moving forward. The intent is to get a firm on board, and then the public process will be developed as part of that uh, scope of work for that firm. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions on any of the informational items? Uh, oh, I guess we, we get the McIntyre? Um, I'm, I'm happy to. I wanted to pause. I okay. ran one through four and thought I should slow down. But if any I'm, questions on one through four? Last chance. All right. Bringing uh, to the council and to the public an update on where we stand with McIntyre. We've had several meetings in furtherance of a project that would pr be pursued through the monument program. Uh, the project team met on June 15th via Zoom. We met in person today. We reviewed uh, many things today, uh, including uh, the responsibility matrix and the timeline and everything from a review of floor plans and programming and uh, got into pieces that uh, we still need to bring on board and uh, leading up to a soon to be held pro forma discussion. The conversation circled around how to properly knit the property back into the downtown framework and to recognize the balance of providing space that generates revenue with the civic gesture that was focal to the community plan with the market shed. So we decided, we, we met for almost three hours today. We decided that every Tuesday moving forward at 10 o'clock, the project team would meet, uh, including uh, this coming Tuesday will be, um, we're calling it a pre-TAC meeting. It's really designed to identify early on those life safety and uh, access type issues with the team that typically reviews projects at the TAC level or technical advisory committee. We will have our first of the 45 day check-ins with the GSA on July 18th. And what we're all focused on and laser focused on is making sure we hit the August 8th date for a submittal of a draft to be considered by the National Park Service. So happy to answer any questions and do plan to keep the council advised as we move forward. Any questions? Not at this time. Thank you, city manager. Any miscellaneous business? <laughs> Councilor Bagley. Sorry, Your Honor, I've got one. Um, <clears throat> yesterday uh, and Sunday, there was some confusion about the new federal holiday. Um, and all of the, if I believe I have it right, that all the federal holidays we observe a parking enforcement holiday. And what that means is you're still technically supposed to pave to park, but there's nobody there to write you a ticket. So it's not free parking, but you can park for free with no repercussions. We need to come up with, it's been a while since we've had a new federal holiday. So as a city, we haven't developed uh, an ordinance to absorb uh, observe um, Juneteenth. So. I guess in light of it just happening and not wanting to forget until next year, I'd like to ask the city uh, manager if we could have a report back on how we go about this procedure of, of adding this federal holiday to all the rest of them from a parking perspective. Um, uh, Councillor Bagley, I'm reminded that you sit on parking and traffic. Uh, it was my oversight. And so, oh, no, no, not in that, but I, um, I would be interested. One, one uh, I heard of this, I was... Uh, you know, Sunday, um, uh, where the federal holiday was not being observed, uh, it, parking was enforced. Uh, Monday, uh, again, it wasn't, uh, I don't, I believe it's a it, part of uh, union collective bargaining which would uh, provide that. So I do believe people were, were still working on that. But to identify, you know, when free parking exists, does it exist on the actual holiday? Does it exist on the observed holiday? Um, would this, um, be something that we could take up in parking and traffic and have a report back to the council on that? I, I think that probably makes a lot of sense. All right. Great. Again, uh, any other questions, miscellaneous? All right. Well, I am sad to say that the Celtics were not victorious, uh, so I can't say go Celtics, it's on to the Red Sox. Uh, and. Uh, there's nothing else. Uh, good night, Portsmouth. Motion to adjourn. Motion oh, yeah. Good night. Motion to adjourn. Yeah. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs>